I'm Tim Robinson. I'm Chief Operating Officer at Tech East, and Tech East is uh, the tech cluster organisation for the east of England, uh, primarily focused on Norfolk and Suffolk. Uh, and co-host with me today is Scott Cockman. Scott, would you like to introduce yourself? Of course, yeah, sorry, I just had a, a bit of an issue to take myself off mute there. Uh, yeah, for that, some of you may be familiar with me. Um, I'm the project coordinator uh, for the Connected Innovation Project, uh, which this event forms part of. Um, for those of you not familiar with the project, um, it's a joint funded project from both the Norfolk Strategic Fund and the Suffolk Inclusive Growth and Investment Fund across Norfolk and Suffolk, uh, looking to really sort of connect the dots between the innovation hubs across both counties, uh, looking to sort of really drive connectivity and collaboration between the hubs with a view to enhancing the innovation capability within both regions uh, and presenting a much more cohesive narrative in terms of the region's strengths with a view to sort of strengthening our inward investment proposition uh, and also uh, the access to innovation funding and also business support as well. So what we're keen to do with events like this is be able to sort of showcase our innovation hubs and the businesses that work within them. So we've got a fantastic um, set of speakers today both uh, businesses that operate from within the hubs, but also the support networks that they work with as well, uh, who can demonstrate what, exactly what's going on uh, within the region. Thanks, Scott. Okay, um, so I'm just gonna, as usual with these things, I'm just gonna start with a couple of housekeeping things. So we are uh, recording this event. Um, because it's a Zoom webinar rather than a Zoom meeting, uh, if you're a delegate uh, rather than a speaker, we won't actually be able to see your face, but we will be able to hear from you uh, in both the chat and later in the Q&A. Um, do introduce yourselves in chat. Who are you? What's your role? Um, what are your interests around this innovation topic? Uh, if you want to put a link into either an email address, if you'd like to connect with people or to your LinkedIn profile, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, uh, it's really great from our point of view if, if, if there's lots of discussion going on in chat during the, during the event. Um, so please be uh, brave and, uh, and, and, and speak up, uh, even if you just want to say hi. Um, the, uh, yeah, the running order today, I was sort of sharing my screen just before just before we started talking, uh, but I'll probably just share it again now, if I may, uh, just to give uh, everyone a um, an idea of what we're going to be covering. So the topic today is underpinning technologies that are un uh, uh, the emerging technologies that are underpinning innovation. Uh, when we're talking about emerging technologies, uh, for anyone who's a... Uh, a fan of government reports and has read the latest government uh, innovation strategy. That strategy talks about seven families of technology, including things like artificial intelligence, virtual and augmented reality, internet of things. Uh, it talks about robotics and, and so on and so forth. And we're not gonna cover all of those underpinning technologies today, but just a, just a sample based on uh, some really in inspiring examples from the business community in Norfolk and Suffolk. And I think it's just an important kind of feature of this event is that we're, we're pairing up um, uh, entrepreneurs with uh, organizations that have supported them in one way or another over the last year or so. Um, so we're gonna be hearing from uh, innovation hubs, we're gonna be hearing from uh, grant uh, funding programs, we're gonna be hearing from incubators we're going to be hearing from public sector funded innovation networks around IoT. So it's going to be all about, you know, hearing practical examples of innovation and also discovering a bit about how that innovation has been supported. And as Scott said, this is part of the Connected Innovation Programme uh, that's uh, been running now uh, through uh, 2021 and will continue in 2020, in 22, and then into the beginning of 23. So this is a two year program. Um, our first speaker um, we'll be hearing from at quarter to 10. So in just a few short minutes, we will then have a series of talks that will run up until midday. And then we're gonna have a panel and we're gonna have a discussion and Q and A. 
And at that point, uh, as we lead into that, please do start to populate the Q&A feature at the bottom of your toolbar with questions. Uh, if you want to put your question in chat, that's absolutely fine. We're pretty relaxed about how you want to do that. So that's the shape of today. Um, just before we get started, I'd just like to, um, I think, reference a couple of reports that have come out recently that I think really do underline the uh, fact, and we all know this locally, that the east of England is an absolute hotspot for innovation, seen through the kind of lens of the whole of the UK. Um, in the recent Tech UK Local Digital Capital Index uh, ranked if you like, ranks the east of England as number two behind London uh, and ahead of all the other regions for innovation. And of course, that includes the whole of the east of England, all six counties, including Cambridge. Uh, so perhaps no great surprise. But it's always nice to, I think, see that there is some realisation and recognition that the east of England is a very vibrant place for innovation. It's a great place to start a business. It's a great place to scale a business. It's a great place to, to, to run a business for the long term. But it's also a great place to partner around innovation. If you're a, a business that is, um, you know, perhaps not, not new, but has been around uh, for some years, whether you're a family run business or whether you are a listed company or whether you are purely, um, you know, a kind of, a, you know, a limited company, that has been working in a particular sector for a number of years, but is really looking to innovate, this is, I would argue, you know, a great place to do that. But it's easy to kind of say that. What I hope we're going to be able to sort of demonstrate this morning and, and, and provide some inspiration around is the wealth of innovation that really is taking place here. In many cases, in very small businesses, very new businesses that have only just been created, maybe incubated uh, during this sort of COVID and post-COVID period. And innovation is clearly going to be a massive uh, element in driving an, an economic recovery in the UK, but also ensuring that in the medium to long term, the UK remains competitive globally in, uh, in areas like digital, like manufacturing, like clean energy, like healthcare like Agritech, uh, right across the piece. And, you know, uh, please, if you want to share in chat examples of things that you're seeing, bit, um, opportunities, you've got questions to ask about innovation and how to actually make it happen in practice, um, we'd love to hear from you. But that's probably, uh, you know, just about enough from me. I, um, you know, I urge everyone to kind of participate and engage in this uh, and kind of lean forward, lean in, uh, do use the chat. Uh, do prepare questions as we go through um, for the speakers. We're not going to take questions from speakers uh, after each uh, after each talk. We're going to take them in a panel at uh, midday. So I think we are just about ready to start with the uh, first talk. Um, we're running a minute ahead of schedule, but here is Hayden. Hello, Hayden. Good morning. How are you? Morning, Hayden. Good morning, everyone. How are we? All right. Well, Hayden, are you, are, you, are you joining us from the east of England or are you in the southwest? No, I'm in the southwest today. Right. So I think this is, and, and I think that's probably a nice place to start, is that, so although this program, Connected Innovation, is, is, is really all about Norfolk and Suffolk and the east of England, um, the... Uh, the people uh, who make up that innovation community, that business community, uh, increasingly we're finding, you know, are based not just all over the UK, but all over the world. Um, so uh, thank you for joining us. I hope it's uh, a little bit uh, drier in the southwest than it is, is here. It's a beautiful day here. I'll send it up your way. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> um, so... As I say, we, we, we're going to hear first from Hayden, um, from uh, Vaturi and from Orbital Global, and then uh, pairing up with Hayden, uh, and this will be the case for each of the, uh, each of the talks today, we could be pairing up um, an entrepreneur with uh, a, a support organisation or a support individual. So we, we're going to be hearing um, straight after, after Hayden from Laura Hill from Norfolk County Council about the innovation mentoring uh, project, uh, which um, 
Hayden and the team have worked with. So um, without further ado, I'm going to turn off my camera. I'm going to put myself on, on mute. And Hayden, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you so much. OK, <clears throat> it's just um, can you see my screen OK? Yeah. All right. So, um, well, first of all, thanks for inviting me along. And um, this is the second time I've been on. Um, the first time, you, if you if you plug if you plugged in, um, I was talking about another innovation of ours called MySpira, which is an augmented reality ASPA, um training app for kids, um, which is doing incredibly well now, uh, and actually um, launching into the NHS right across the country. I'm really pleased to say. But today, I'm going to tell you a little story about another innovation we've been working on for what feels like a lifetime. It's half a lifetime, I guess. It's five years, um, but it's essentially. Uh, our journey from a concept through to the development, through to fundraising and the commercialization, um, which, which, you know, we're, we're Peter and I, Peter is, is my co-founder and our CEO. I'm the chief operating officer of a company called Orbital Global and Vituri, with Vituri being a spin-out technology from Orbital, and I'll come to that in a minute. <clears throat> So let's just give you. Now I'm going to take you back to 2015. You might remember that this guy hit the headlines. I'm sure there's a few guesses as to why, but essentially it came down to him punching his producer, I believe. But uh, I thought I'd just date stamp it um, so, so we know what we're talking about here. <clears throat> now, Peter and I have, have, have built a nice little business called Orbital uh, Media. Um, we're very much focused on digital marketing. And one of our clients, and specifically in consumer healthcare, and one of our clients is Invercol. Now, if you've got kids, um, you probably know the product quite well. Um, it's a, um, a colic um, medical device, essentially. You give to screaming kids in the middle of the night to try and help calm them a little bit. Colic's a horrible thing. Um, but as, anyway, we, what we were finding was the car, the, we, we were seeing a huge amount of traffic is hitting their website in the middle of the night, hitting the brand website saying, you know, and looking for answers. And to be honest, it was one of, back in 2015, very basic website with, with an FAQs page, but didn't really do a lot. So we decided to build a little search engine and we used some open source sof software called Spring to do this. So we, 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 we did a bit of mapping as to the most commonly asked questions around colic. And then we found this healthcare professional you see before you, um, and we, 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 we gave her the questions in advance and said, right, prepare 30 second answers for these. We put her in a booth and we, 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 we recorded her answering all of these questions. And essentially we chopped them all up and built her own little search engine within the website. So you type in a question about colic, if I click to the next one, um, you can see, you know, can colic cause reflux? These are all the most commonly asked questions. There was about 150 of them. First of all, we shoved them up all up on YouTube and optimized them accordingly. And they got about 2 million views without spending a penny in a year. So suddenly the brand got, it became a lot, uh, the brand awareness became uh, really quite special. Uh, but secondly, this, this website, <clears throat> this little engine was working incredibly well. Um, and we, we had lots of videos on there of people, uh, of, of this lady showing you how to calm a colicky baby naturally. It wasn't all about the product and what have you, but it was a really, it was a really interesting experiment for us. And we saw annual sales for the, um, for the product jump by 7.5% and thought, well, yeah, there was some other activity going on, but this had accounted for an awful lot. The YouTube stuff, the, 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 drive, the, not, the drive for the knowledge, the patient knowledge was, was so strong. So we set, Peter and I set ourselves a challenge and we, we're, all up, we're always up for a challenge, um, but how can we scale information delivery in the most visual, accurate and textual way properly? Okay, how can we create something that delivers information 24 seven, really cost effectively, really accurately and grows in, grows in accuracy? Um, <clears throat> and then at, at this point in time, we had three, uh, three key people parties come into our lives. Firstly, Innovate UK, which was exactly where we started. Started with this conversation. We started with this problem. We talked to Innovate UK and said, look, this is what we want to achieve. We want to scale what we've developed and proven the concept of here very cheaply into something really quite special. So they then suggested we look at knowledge transfer partnerships, which would, would, our first knowledge transfer partnership was with the University of Suffolk and for our MySpire application. The next two, we, we undertook two more. We haven't done any more than that, but we undertook two more. One with the University of Essex, first of all, and one with Cardiff University. And the, the beauty of KTPs now is that 
you can choose any university across the country. So you can choose the strongest data science departments, uh, computer science departments, or, or whatever department. You you can go and handpick whoever you want to work with, which was which was really um, a fantastic opportunity. There were some hurdles along the way, as in they don't all work to the same contract, uh, and you have to really be very careful about IP and everything else in those contracts. So just word of warning, quick flag up there. Uh, but essentially, Cardiff University were charged with helping us develop a an avatar, and this is a very simple. Um, I'll, I'll give you an idea of what it looked of, of what the first renditions looked like. Where we took a this is a real human, um, and we took that human um, to we but we 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 managed to um, computer generate new lips essentially, and have them sort of talk Hello. about other things. Welcome to coughs, colds, and flu vert jury. I'm Dr. Matt Pickover, a GP, here to answer your questions about coughs, colds, and flu. If you have a question, type it into the box or select it from the drop down menu. OK, so he is a real human and this is where we started, uh, but we wanted to kind of scale. We needed to scale information, remember, so we needed to scale. We needed the ability to, to, to control what they said and what they say. And, um, and that was the that was the grand challenge, if you like. And with you, with, with the University of Essex, we work very closely with their um, computer science department, fantastic team. And we produced essentially a machine learning chatbot. All right, so very, very simple expression there. <clears throat> we then had our, the core of idea, our idea. We had two fantastic um, um, uh, knowledge transfer associates uh, come out of both um, Essex and Cardiff. Uh, and we wanted to protect our idea. And yes, you know, there's a big, there was a big commitment in terms of cost, but it was really important. We, we, this is a long term. We, we never, we never look at our technology as short term, and I don't believe anyone should because it's not a quick fix. You've got to keep reading the future, if you like, and understanding where the future is, and believing in that, and really, you know, putting your chips on that space. So we, we, we took the, uh, we took the decision to invest what money we were making out of Orbital into this new idea and essentially it was just an idea that we're putting a lot of um, a lot of uh, hope on if you like a bit of a gamble but hey it's all a gamble but as long as we were enjoying it we were prepared to do it so we teamed up with Burkitts and IP21 and protected our IP perhaps protected our trademarks we've got a UK patent we've got US patent we've got EU patents and, and looking into other patents too but that methodology um, was key to well, a number of different things really, um, but primarily funding, fundraising, because you'll find a lot of investors are going to ask you about that. And it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a, 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 bit, of, a bit of a debate. Um, it depends on which investors you talk to, but from our perspective, it's too important. If your idea is, is strong enough and you want to protect it, it does help you kind of really believe because you've invested in this. It does help you really to drive you on knowing that you've got a patent and you've got something of value here. So we would recommend that. Fast forward 2019, so there's been lots of development going on in the back end. Now, I don't know if anyone recognizes this, but this was the first picture of a black hole, believe it or not. There's another fact for you. Uh, again, just another timestamp. So we, we, our experience, um, the last 20 years, Peter and I's experience is in, is in healthcare mainly. So we looked at healthcare and thought, what are the problems in healthcare that our technology could potentially solve all right, so we've always had a focus on healthcare, but you know, when you first get an idea, your mind runs crazy with, oh, it could do this, it could do political campaigns, it could do everything else. And suddenly you, you, you lose a lot of focus. So we said, no, you know, we pulled ourselves back, reined ourselves in a little bit and said, no, what is it about healthcare that we need to fix? Uh, and there's a lot of problems with healthcare that we need to fix. Um, and I've just listed a couple here. The primar pr primarily, the, the one we wanted to fix was the poor patient engagement, because if we can fix patient engagement, i.e. people understanding, listening to how they can fix themselves, then essentially there'll be less strain on the, on the primary healthcare system. And ultimately, if people take better care of themselves, they don't get to secondary care necessarily, as, well, the chances reduce a little bit. So it takes that whole, um, that whole strain out the system, if you like. So, we wanted to improve patient engagement, understanding, um, and, and recall of critical healthcare information. All right. 
And we under, we then sort of scratched a little bit further and understood that the full opportunity of um, the potential in health, if you like, there's the information is is absolutely key. And, and I, I'm sure we're all guilty of when you get a little snivel, you start go, you know using Doctor Google, if you like, and uh, and, and saying, oh, I've got a snivel, and it comes, it ends up normally in something terrible that you're going to die in a week's time or something, which is which is absolute nonsense. So. Um, we, we really want to, to in, we really want to have a, create a central and very visual um, space for for delivering healthcare information. But you can imagine all of these elements here uh, are are absolutely vital and uh, opportunities for for giving more information away uh, in a much more visual way. And, I, and again, I, I'm speaking from my own experience, but. Give me uh, maybe every guy. I don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm being a bit harsh there, but give a guy a, a, an instruction manual. It normally ends up in the bin. I, I personally need to need to be uh, need to need to be shown it visually, uh, um, or, or shown what, how to how to follow a, a task visually. I'm a visual person, uh, and then I could do it. I could do it till the cows come home. But it's and that's essentially what what this the, the, the core idea came from. But we got some early iterations with it. Um, we we started, we developed it, we deployed it on the Pseudochrome website, um, Infocol website. We've got a pathway into the NHS now. Um, we're working on a Ministry of Justice project at a Melinda Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation project, which is all very exciting. Um, we built an apps, well, I believe it's a really kick ass team. Um, um, it, obviously, Peter's got a lot of experience. We're talking about um, this is one of our KTP associates, Dr. Satish Sankapandi. Um, very very intelligent guy. He's head of head of data science <clears throat> for us. And then we've worked we're working with individuals. You might recognise some of these being um, from from around Suffolk, uh, who are quite senior in the NHS over there, uh, but who are really passionate about. And this is the most important thing. Who who bought into the concept actually five years ago when we actually sat down in front of them and said, "What do you think? Could this work?" We did some very basic research, uh, and these two individuals, Dr. Simon Rudland and Paul Brown, were very very excited. Uh, and, and remain excited uh, about the, the project and the fact that they've sat sat with us and not been paid for five years, uh, I think goes, goes to, says, says an awful lot about that. We also built a, a medical advisory board. Um, again, some incredible names in there uh, with, with a lot of contacts and a lot of knowledge um, helping us develop out um, this, um, this opportunity. We evolved our brand and mission. We suddenly, we didn't know quite what to call ourselves. What are we? You know, are we a next generation avatar? We're next generation digital assistant? No, let's pull it right back to healthcare. We're a clinical informatics avatar. Our mission, as I mentioned earlier, to improve health outcomes for millions of people and save billions of pounds by improved delivery and understanding of critical healthcare information. And it's amazing how long it takes you to come up with something so succinct. But it, it, we now live by this statement. It's very important to us. We became accountable. So we teamed up with the EHSN, and I suggest that if you have a medical, if you are a medical entrepreneur or have some med tech, I would absolutely talk to these guys. They're incredible. Um, they have mentorship uh, and extensive networking uh, opportunities. They're essentially paid by the NHS to find innovation um, and launch you into the NHS. They've done amazing stuff for us. Um, we work very closely with Innovate UK Edge, and we were selected as one of the 30 UK companies to be placed on the um, scale up program, which again, it kind of, it's like the men in black for, for, UK, uh, for, for Innovate UK, if you like, you get to meet some incredible individuals with an awful lot of experience who can really guide you. Um, we've been listed on the Department of International Trade uh, in their new um, digital health playbook as one to watch, which we're incredibly proud of seeing as we haven't absolutely launched yet. But all these things, and I'm not just saying these just to blow our own trumpets here, but they're all very important. Um, my point is that they're all very important to, to kind of give you kudos and credibility when talking to, when trying to commercialise, which is all fundraise, you know, two things that kind of have to work in tandem with each other. Um, we're working on um, using, integrating a paper, something called a patient activation measure study, which is gold, NHS gold standard stuff, very simple to integrate um, questionnaires into your technology that measures the, the how well um, patients respond uh, to processes, if you like. 
Um, we've got some we've got some approval from some key industry um, bodies in consumer healthcare specifically. But again, it's a, it just goes to show that to get them on side, uh, it, it plays a key part. And then we, we look, we're working with the University of Essex on a standalone clinical study also. So then we come to the funding element. Now, this is where it gets fun and challenging at the same time. Um, and the first thing I would actually do is, is ask myself, if I did all this again, I'd ask myself, you know, how much you know, do we need Do we need the money? And we were, we were lucky enough because Peter and I have, have built a very successful business in Orbital in that that could finance um, our work and our passion up until that point. So we have, you know, other sources of income, if you like, we were quite lucky in that regard, but we also tested out the concept in the market. So it did work quite well. But we also, interestingly, another question is how much do you need and where do you want to spend it? And suddenly ideas of grandeur of, yeah, let's just go and raise 10, 20, 30 million. You know, they quickly disappear. I don't want to, I'm sure, so, so I don't want to put anyone down for, for trying to raise that sort of money, but it's, it's, the more you want to raise, the harder it becomes um, from exper personal experience. And also, you, you don't necessarily need that money. You'd be giving away too much too early if you're looking at seed round. We went through 10 iterations of our deck, and that was quite painful because we thought we had it right every time. We ended up speaking to so many different types of investor, uh, which I'll talk about in a sec, and each one had a different opinion. And ultimately, it comes down to what you're comfortable saying, what you totally believe in but also listening to the right people. And there's some fantastic people. Uh, I'll mention Anglia Capital Group, brilliant bunch of people, Sally Goodsell, um, Martin Rigby, uh, some, some other people who are very, very senior in the East of England who would be able to guide you. And there are grants available uh, to help you get your deck in, in, in a decent order. Um, I believe we, we got some money through the LEP to help us do that. We trained, we pitch trained, um, we practiced and practiced and practiced again, get on as, go and talk to as many people and pit, ask them to stand in front of them and pitch as many times as you can, um, because the, the, the more succinct you can get it, it, it changes every time you pitch it, but ultimately you'll suddenly, it will just all click. The more you do it, it'll just click and, and it becomes really believable and people, and you start believing it even more, people buy into you. Um, we constantly question evaluation. It's really hard to put a value on a new technology, uh, especially when you're not necessarily commercializing it. Um, we had plans, like I say, plans of grandeur um, and thought um, we actually got buy-in uh, at, a, at a 30 million pounds valuation um, uh, and somebody willing to give us a quarter of a million pounds off the bat, which we thought, okay, well, that's our valuation. And we valued it off, the, off doing a lot of market research of other techn similar technologies. But actually, um, that fell through, as many things, many of these deals tend to. Uh, and, and we came right back to earth and said, no, it wouldn't have been right anyway. Yes, it's great to, to have that sort of valuation, but it's not sustainable in the future. And you've got to think about not just now, not just the seed round, but the Series A, the Series B, the exit. You know, you've got to, you've got to almost plan that pathway um, and be realistic about it too. There's no harm in saying, okay, well, I'll tell you what, we're not £30 million pound company, we're £2.5 million pound back, um, company. Still very impressive. Let's raise half a million, which is exactly what we did. Let's raise half a million um, as a seed. And we know that in two, in two years' time, when we go for Series A, because half a million is going to give us, get us to this point here, this step here, suddenly things are really going to open for us. We're going to have a valuation of between 10 and 15 million to 20 million um, and then you know it becomes it becomes really quite a credible uh, opportunity but but be realistic is all I'm saying we explored all routes to money and and I'm not saying uh, I don't know what's right for your technology but personally I've got a uh, we, we funded everything initially through grants so grants being KTPs uh, two KTPs and we got a few other little grants here and there um, but that was about a quarter of a million pounds worth of, of over maybe four years. And then we got to this iteration of the deck and wanted to go out and get some fundraising, half a million pounds. We, we were advised to talk to, to VCs. We did. It wasn't the right fit. We weren't advanced enough at VCs. We've met some fantastic VCs, by the way, and we'll absolutely go that route for Series A. But for Seed, for getting that idea off the ground, you want, you want people, it's not necessarily about them, 
about the money either. It's about people who can bring what to you. Let them sell themselves to you. If they believe in the idea, brilliant. You know, just work, work on that relationship. But if they don't, you'll know quickly enough because they won't waste their time with you. And don't be offended by that. They get hundreds of pictures all the time. VCs wasn't right for us at this stage. It is for next stage, um, Series A. So um, we ultimately went the angels route. Okay, and we got some really we got some fantastic commitments from those guys, and met some really really interesting people who have who have been in the VC space, funny enough, and made an awful lot of money and have an awful lot of contacts and are perhaps you know just looking to 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 extend their their network further and get involved in something in the next big thing. You know, everyone's looking for the next big thing, but these these people are are absolutely turned on to the idea. But crowdfunding, I would absolutely advise to go and talk to Crowdcube too. They've been brilliant. Um, we haven't launched on Crowdcube. We were going to, um, but we decided against it only for um, the reason that our, you, you have to have a cornerstone invest, investment um, of around about a third to a half of the money you're looking for. But you can raise, I'd say, seed up to about half a million pounds or um, quite easily on crowdfunding. Um, if, if the opportunity is right, and also use it as a business development tool, give people, uh, uh, give the investors, the retail investors, uh, a deal, if you like. So a very, very quick, I just want to show the way, where we got to now, and which is a really exciting, I'm very proud of this point, got a long way to go still. Um, excuse the lip sync, it's only because it's embedded in PowerPoint, um, but here we go. I'm Virtuary, a next generation, digital human assistant and a combination of patented, machine learning and avatar technologies. I deliver consistent responses at scale, and once trained, I average 95% accuracy. Visually, I can reflect multiple ethnicities, ages and genders, as well as speak multiple languages if required. I am already being utilized by multinational brands, as well as preparing for deployment into the NHS, easing the patient pathway across a range of key health-related topics. Right now, my primary purpose is to help reduce the cost of scaled information delivery whilst improving patient and consumer education and engagement. It is important to note that whilst I'm not human, my creators are pioneering robust ethical guidelines around the use of hyper-realistic avatars. Whenever you see the virtual watermark avatar icon in the bottom right, it denotes that I am not a real person. My future is exciting. Okay, I've got to, I've got to, I appreciate I've gone over time here, so I'm going to whiz through this. Um, we've got a really exciting future to look forward to, uh, multiple deployments into the NHS. Um, we're looking at rare disease and, and, and looking at health insurance and pharma markets. Um, we are expanding overseas, expanding the technical team, really interesting to, 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 to data scientists, full stack developers, expanding RIP and, and working towards a Series A in 2023. Thank you so much. That's it. So I rushed the end there. I appreciate it. I've gone over time a little bit. Hey, you know, there's a lot to cover there. Um, I don't know why I can't see my video. So, oh, I don't know. <laughs> no, I mean, it's such a rich story. And I'm, you know, and thank you for com com coming, coming and talking again. And I know, as you said, you, you, you recently spoke at our, at our healthcare event, actually. Um, I mean, what strikes me with, uh, and, uh, what really strikes me about the Turi and about the kind of Orbital Global Group is, is how effectively and sort of persistently you've, you've gone out and tapped into all of these um, programs. Um, you know, really, you, you mentioned kudos, credibility, you know, kudos and credibility with, also with investors, presumably that really, really helps. Um, I, and, and I guess just before we, you know, before we hand over, um, how do you do it? How do you find the time to do it? Do you find that it's a good investment of time overall um, to be really looking into all these programs? Or can it sometimes become a little bit of a, a distraction from actually, you know, building the product and selling the product? Yeah, it's a good question, Tim. Uh, this is why I come right back to what I said is, is the focus. Focus on one, one problem to solve, not the whole world's problems. And the, the smaller you can make the problem, the more actually you'll find partners to, that, that will get it and support you in that um, and champion you, champion you in the early days. So easy to try and run before you can walk 
Um, so, so really focus on that. I mean, we're quite lucky. We've got a fantastic team. Our team are multi-talented in that they and they have to wear multi hats every day. So they have to, they, they know the big opportunity with the jury and they're incentivized to, to make it happen. Um, but they also have a day job to do as well. So we, we, everyone's doing stuff on the fly and, not, and and for nothing essentially, but it's for a bigger opportunity in the end of it. Okay, well, great talk. And Hayden, thanks again. So um, I'm now going to um, ask Laura to uh, come on to the virtual uh, stage. Um, and, 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 and um, you know, there was a key, I think a key, key part of that presentation was talking about, you know, the relation, the importance and the relationship, if you're trying to innovate, of grant funding, possibly right at the beginning, but also as, 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 you, as you go through that journey of different thought. And Laura is here from Norfolk County Council to talk a little bit, hopefully, about, about what is on offer, uh, what's been on offer to, to, to Hayden and the team, but what's on offer for other businesses in the region. Laura. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Tim and Hayden. Um, my name's Laura Hill, and I work for Norfolk County Council as the project manager of the Innovation Grant Mentoring Project. Um, the project was set up at the end of last year, um, to offer support to businesses across Norfolk and Suffolk, um, as we could see that, um, as Hayden was saying, that um, we can help businesses link into um, to funding such as Innovate UK. Um, Innovate UK, um, excuse me, um, <clears throat> can really help uh, businesses um, access innovation funding and uh, drive businesses on. So the project was set up um, to be able to support businesses access, access this funding and also, um, and also um, or have support from our mentors and coaches. <clears throat> so the project, we have um, an expert panel of mentors and coaches on our project and um, they offer um, support. I'll just share some, see if I can share my slides with you. Yeah, we can see those now. Fantastic, sorry, I was having some problems at the beginning getting those through. I had a bit of a unstable inter internet connection, uh, but I think that's come through now. So, um, I'll start properly now, excuse me. Um, so the vision of the project is to help um, businesses across Norfolk and Suffolk um, increase the success within innovation funding and um, from schemes such as Innovate UK. Um, innovation funding from, from the likes of Innovate UK, UK can really help um, research and develop a new process or idea um, for businesses and test innovation, test their innovation ideas um, through having that additional funding support. And it can really help accelerate um, the innovation and drive businesses into investment, into their investment. So what the Innovation Grant Mentoring Project is all about, um, really, we have um, a we run free um, workshops and webinars, and um, that we run those um, webinars every sort of every six to eight weeks, and they're all around innovation funding. And um, we have our mentors and coaches who are on those um, on, on those webinars, along with myself, giving um, advice, more generic advice, really, on how to access innovation funding. And then, if you apply to the project, um, we can. Um, it potentially can apply for bespoke um, support through mentoring um, and our bid coaches as well. And we have up to um, 20 hours of mentoring and up to 35 hours of bid coaching available um, from our mentors and coaches. Um, our mentors and coaches have been through um, the innovation funding process, um, either applying for companies as uh, applying on behalf of companies um, as bid coaches, and understand how difficult um, some of the application forms can be. Um, so they can help guide businesses on how to put those together. 
um, our mentors have been through the process of innovation funding, um, know the challenge, know the um, the benefits, but also the challenges and the pitfalls involved in that, um, and they can help guide you along the right route for your business um, and support you in that journey through the you know, the hours we have free on this project to be able to support businesses within Norfolk and Suffolk. Um, as I said, we have 20 hours of support free um, on the mentoring and 35 hours on the big coaching. So it's, you know, it's a good number of hours to help work with businesses through this, um, through this process, which coming into um, innovation funding, it's, it may be something you, you don't know anything about um, and want guidance on how, how to access it, because often we find businesses come to us going, I know about Innovate UK, but I don't quite know how how to get there. And how, how where do I start? There are so many different um, organisations um, who 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 have innovation funding available potentially, and there are so many competitions. What do I do? Where do I start? You know, some some people may go into innovation funding, um, see a competition through Innovate UK, which closes maybe next week, and um, look to try and apply for that. And because innovation funding, it's such an opportunity, but it's also a really difficult process. Um, you really need to spend time preparing your bid, um, perhaps even before the competitions become, are advertised. Um, so um, working with our mentors and coaches in preparing you prior to that application process um, is really important. Um, so this project is, is all about supporting businesses um, in Norfolk and Suffolk with the free support. Um, and our mentors, you know, they, they have gained so much through um, innovation funding. They're really wanting to pass that knowledge on to help um, the success of future businesses within Norfolk and Suffolk. So our project, who's it for? Well, um, it's available to um, Norfolk and Suffolk SMEs from any, any sector. Um, and it might be a business that has had innovation su um, support before through innovation funding um, and we're looking to apply for a future competition or it might be to, um, to businesses who are completely new to innovation funding um, or it might be that uh, businesses have applied for innovation funding before hadn't been unsuccessful you know don't be deterred it is a difficult process to go through and we can help you uh, achieve success um, through our experts on our on our program. So as I've sort of already touched on, just to get the, the support we have available um, through our mental workshops and bid writing workshops, and then by application, um, you can apply for the bespoke support on the project from our mentors and coaches. Um, so just to conclude, um, and sometimes I know we're sort of um, coming up on time. Um, so the Innovation Grant Mentoring Project, if you're interested in innovation funding, it might be you haven't found a competition you want to apply for as yet. Um, we'd really urge you to come and speak to um, us. Um, I've got the details of our web page where you can register or find out more information on this slide um, and also our email address. Um, please don't feel you have to have found a competition you want to apply for before approaching us. We'd much rather that businesses approach us before they've got to that point. Um, we can discuss the, um, the, the merits of innovation funding with you um, and see whether you, your ideas would fit and whether you are um, eligible for the free um, bespoke mentoring and coaching um, from the project. So you know, please do get in touch. Um, or um, look out for our webinars as well, which will be advertising. We've got another one coming up towards the end of November, um, which I'll be advertising the details of shortly. So look out for that and come and join us um, and see some of the experts we've got on our project. Um, the mentors and coaches we've got you know, are fantastic. I'm really proud that um, we've got them, those involved in our project. And um, obviously, I've, um, we're very Please, when we launched the project at the end of last year, that uh, Peter and Hayden from Orbital were so supportive on the set off of, of this project um, and have really helped us um, uh, in the startup and helped us promote the project 
um, to businesses across Norfolk and Suffolk. So now we're just getting the word out that this free support is available. Um, if you're considering innovation funding, you know, I'd really urge you to get in touch with us and we'll see if we can help you in that journey to hopefully improve your chances of success um, through your application. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Brilliant. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think I think you 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 you've got it absolutely right. You know, it's not it's not a straightforward process. Always getting 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 these grants. You know, even the application process is it can it can be can be very time consuming, and you know there are there are do's and don'ts. Uh, and I think it's been it's been wonderful to see this this program come together because it was a definite um, uh, missing link. In, in around the innovation landscape. Uh, and uh, as I say, uh, you, you've, you've shared some contact details. Do get in touch with Laura and the team to find out more. And although I don't want to add to Hayden's to-do list, I'm sure that Hayden or Peter Brady at Orbit Hill would, um, would also act as sort of advocates if you're interested in whether the program's right for you. So thank you very much, Laura. Now, next up, we have a very exciting. No, thank, thanks very much. I'll put yeah. the um, information in the chat. Thanks. OK, thanks, Laura. Um, so next up, we have a, a super exciting new business. Um, uh, SKC G Game Studio is, uh, I'm told, is a blow your mind independent games design development and publishing company located in Suffolk of all places. And uh, so the myth that there are no games companies in Norfolk and Suffolk has now been busted. We have uh, Aza Burrows from SKC Game Studio and the Beta Devi from uh, the Epicenter in Haverhill to talk about SKC Game Studio. Over to you, Aza. Okay, yeah. Good, good morning, everybody. Um, as Tim said, I'm, I'm Aza Burrows, the co-founder and head of SKC Games. And... Um, We've now got the new Debbie for Oxygen Innovation, who managed the Epicenter in Hayley Hill. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about our game studio and what it is that we're doing and uh, what sort of funding that we've been looking to be raising. We've raised some funding um, and I'll talk to you a bit about the support that we've had from the Epicenter and then I'll hand off, off to the beta. Okay. Um, I'm going to just share my screen and hopefully you'll be able to see our PowerPoint, right? Um, yeah, looking good. Excellent, that's great. Okay, so so a little bit about, about who we are. We are um, a, a AAA game studio that, that's based out of Suffolk. Um, we're actually the only AAA game studio in the region, although there, it's a very strong gaming community within East Anglia. Um, we are... Um, developing a role-playing game, um, which is more of a franchise rather than just a game because it will be a series of games that we plan to develop over the next decade. Um, that, that franchise we call Project UN, and uh, we think that Project UN is going to become one of the, the biggest brands of the 2020s. Um, now, I the team, and this is the, the, the key thing about when you're building up, up a business. And I'm going to sort of not talk much about SKC Games at this point, but I'm going to sort of talk about more about the journey we've been on. But um, SKC Games and Project Dream was a concept that I've had for a very, very long time. Um, having run other businesses myself, specifically in the data analytics and um, uh, data communication um, industry, um, I fell out of the gaming industry a couple of decades ago. And, and, and found uh, uh, business opportunities <laughs> in other areas. But, but I, I, in the last few years, I recently came back into the gaming industry because I had a particular project that I wanted to do. And while I had some experience in the gaming industry, um, due to obviously the massive innovation that's gone on in, in that industry, uh, the industry had moved on quite a lot since, since when I was first in it. And I knew that for us to be able to build um, a, 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 an award-winning, fantastic game, we would have to bring in an award-winning team. And so I, I spent a long time, a couple of years, finding the right people that, that I think would be ideal to come in into our, into our game and work on our project. And you know, bringing people into the project isn't just about finding someone and saying, come on, let's have, get involved. 
you have to kind of sell the idea and the concept to them as well. And that's, a, and that's not an easy thing when you're trying to build, build the right team. Um, but that said, we have managed to pull together a fantastic team that is working on, on really what is a really fan, fantastic project. Um, and just to give you a, a bit of a taste of the sort of games that this team have worked on in leadership roles, it'll give you an idea of the sort of like the gravitas that the team carries in terms of the games that they've worked on in the past. Um, as well as the team core team itself, obviously when you're building a business, you can't do it all yourself. You do need strategic partners. And we have got two very, very good strategic partners working with us on this particular game. We have Unity, who we have chosen to be our engine partners. And we have a company called Target 3D that specialise in the motion capture um, field for both film, television and for interactive games. Right. So some of you are probably wondering, what is a AAA game? Well, the gaming industry is absolutely massive and there are thousands of games that are published each year. But there is a very niche market, which is known as the AAA space, where there isn't so many titles released annually. And the reason for that is because they are very big games that take a long time to develop. Um, these games can take from between three to five years and in some cases as long as 10 years to develop. Um, and this is because they generally have very high quality cinematic graphics. Um, they have animation that has actually been generated through motion capture from real actors as opposed to machine generated. Um, the games themselves tend to have very, very large environments that the player is free to roam in. And, you know, back in the late 90s, the benchmark was set very high by studios like the Vesta um, when they uh, launched massive open world games that the players can play. And so there is an expectation now that when a player buys an open world game, not only are they following a mainline story, but they're free to go off and do other things, things that they may well do in the real world, but they're doing in the virtual world. And so these games tend to be quite big. All right? um, on top of that, as well as main missions and stuff, you know, there is an expectation that players meet other characters in the environment that have got nothing to do with the main story, but may have their own little storylines and quests that they'd like to do as well. And so it's, it's this combination of high quality graphics, a performance, um, um, motion capture and large environments and big gameplay that is what is considered a AAA game. Right. Our game um, is a science fiction game. It's set into the future. You can actually learn more about this game if you go onto our website, uh, www.projectun.uk and uh, there we've kind of got a little teaser, um, a bit of text there, kind of give you a little bit of an idea of what the story is about and uh, what we're planning to do over the next two, three years while we're developing the game is to sort of like let, let more and more out. All right? But the game itself is open world. But that says um, within the game, the player is able to go off and do other things. Now, the individual can play on their own or they can play um, in cooperative with a friend. But what they can also do in the game is they can join a massive audience of people doing events. And what that means is it doesn't necessarily mean that these people are involved in the main storyline of the game, but it's just given the player that ability if they want to reach out and play other people or challenge people in a particular style of, of event that we, we've got running within the game, they can do that. All right. um, in terms of our innovation and, and our, our focus in innovation, um, building like a big AAA game, it, it takes an awful lot of people, a lot of different skills. And sometimes when you a company like us that's starting out in this space, um, you have to kind of really focus your energy, your, 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 your skills, and what it is you're actually open to achieve. It's going to give you your USPs when you're building your product. And as much as possible, try not to do everything yourself, which is the reason why we have strategic partners, such as Unity, who are providing us with the core game engine. And that said, on top of that engine, we're doing other um, innovation in areas around machine learning, and uh, which everyone likes to refer to as artificial intelligence these days, which the gaming industry has always been involved with. AI has always been a key factor of, of, of the gaming, game, gaming innovation. But, but over the last two, three decades, gaming technology has really enhanced in, in hardware, in you know, quality of graphics, and of course, you know, the AI has improved. But with the, the need for AI, and machine learning to have an awful lot of data that needs to be processed to really get patterns and outcomes of what it is that you're trying to achieve. It's only been recent times that that power has actually been there. 
And so at SKC, what we believe, the next 10 years, maybe even the next 10 to 20 years, real big innovation in the game industry is going to come in that space, in that AI space, in terms of how characters are interacting with characters within the game, um, not just in terms of what those characters are doing in terms of challenging the player and changing the outcome of the way the player is playing, but also in the way that they communicate with that player. Um, with the, the speaker you, you saw before us when they had their um, 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 AI characters talking on, on the screen and, you know, probably take you through a journey and, 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 and as, as you're learning about your medical history. That same type of technology will be used in gaming when players are talking to the characters in the game. Now today, <clears throat> that is very linear, very structured, very specific. You can talk to characters in the game today. Technology is there, it's there, people can do it. A lot of people don't bother, but they can. But they have to give quite specific instructions. But in the future, they won't. They'll be able to have a chat with the player that they're playing within the, in, in the game, you know, and it will feel real. And, and that's, that's the kind of eerie thing about the way that that sort of technology is, is going. And for us, that's a really big area that we're specifically focusing our attention on at the back end. So not the stuff you see at the front end, you can see the outcome, but it's all the clever stuff that we want to do at the back end. So our game itself is, is, a, is a AAA um, RPG, open world, stealth shooter hacking. It is a bit of everything for everybody. Um, and that's deliberate because if you're actually creating an open world environment that's replicating the real world, there's a little bit of everything in the real world as there, as there is in this game. I want. The game itself is set into the future, um, not too far into the future. The year is 2114. Um, but, but in that time, we have discovered a new planet. And there are now two Earths that, 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 that are involved. Uh, that are working and communicating with each other. And unlike a lot of stories about us discovering worlds and us going to war with all these planets, we're not actually at war with this planet. We work with this planet. You know, we have a relationship with this planet. And in fact, what's happened is, is where we have globalization, that's kind of elevated into a universal um, um, ization where planets are, uh, are trading. And of course, when you've got trading between um, planets, you potentially are inviting criminal entities into that and then you have interplanetary crime. And so our game is kind of set in that kind of scene where your characters that you're playing are playing investigators that are not working for the police or for your government, but you're actually working for the UN who has become the elevated um, voice for Earth and, and, and for the fictional planet. Okay. Now, the future isn't apocalyptic. It isn't a utopia. And what we've done is we've worked with some historians, we've looked at what's happened in the last hundred years, and we've tried to guess what the next hundred years might look like, especially if we discovered another planet. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to create an environment for the player that gives them discovery, but at the same time gives them some familiarity. So while they're discovering new things, they're seeing things that are similar and things that they can see today. And we kind of see that as a way of kind of enhancing people's view of the planet that we have today um, in the context of what that could look like, like in the future, while at the same time taking them into new worlds and new discoveries. Um, so yeah, it's, it's got kind of a really um, big ambition in terms of what we're trying to achieve. But what we've done quite cleverly, the team have managed to do, is to bring that vastness down into a, a structured story so that while the player is in this big em environment, and it is a big environment, the, the, the story itself is a very manageable, deliverable proposition that, that, that the player can, can do without, you know, getting lost. Um, I talked about the characters. The game itself has got three main open world environments. It's got a location on Earth, which I, I can actually tell you it's actually the Isle of Rum in Scotland um, and the Isle of Ig. Um, it has a colossal space station. Now, this space station sits between the two planets. It's there for a reason. I'm not going to explain what that reason is too much away, but it is a huge station. It's like, it's, it's, it's as big as the Isle of Rum, maybe even bigger. Um, and uh, and it, it ends up being a, a, a place that you travel to when you go to the fictional planet, which we call Terradine. 
What we've been doing as a business is we've been raising investment. Um, we're raising investment to build the minimal viable product of our game, which um, is effectively the, the core uh, game mechanics, uh, the open world environments that we've generated for Caribbean and Earth, and, um, and the intro stories for the two main characters in the game. Although, like you would expect from role playing games, you, you get to develop these characters. Um, and, and they end up becoming your own. Um, but we've also been looking to raise the funding for the full production of the game. And, and you know, building a game like this, um, a AAA game, you know, it, it, it will cost 10 million plus um, to, to complete the full production of the game. And that in, in this particular space is actually a relatively small budget for a game. You know, some bigger titles, um, spend 20 30 40 million there's there's been titles the most expensive developed title is destiny it cost 500 million dollars to build so it is it, it certainly sounds like it's a lot of money we're raising but actually in the in the space that we're operating in and the, the people we're competing with our budget is very very modest and for me thank you Thank you, Acer. So as you can see, the vision is huge. Um, it's been brilliant to have Acer at the centre. The centre, um, as Tim said earlier, is the Airport Centre in Haverhill, um, where we're coming from today. And it's an innovation centre that opened in March of last year. Um, so just to give you an idea, it's like a four-storey building, uh, just short of 30,000 square foot of office space with laboratory space on the ground floor. And Acer is one of our first customers who's taken residence on the very top floor of the centre. Um, the work that, uh, so it's part, the centre is part of Oxford Innovations Network of 27 centres around the UK. And all of the centres have the same ethos, which is how do we bring startup organisations into the space? How do we help them to grow? And then how do we help them to exit into the local ecosystem to support economic prosperity? With the GAINS project, it's been particularly interesting because the work that ACE is doing is not just about how do we create the AAA GAINS employer in Suffolk, but it's bigger than that. It's going to need a whole ecosystem of GAINS companies to support um, this project for this to be successful. So part of the work that we're doing here at the centre at the moment, for example, is to see whether we can build a motion capture studio, which will end up being the biggest of its kind outside of London in the game space. And, and that facility would also um, be available to the academic institutions in the east of England to start to bridge the gap between what's happening in academia and what the needs are of the games industry. Um, so there's, there's work that we're doing like that and, and those sort of projects, I think that's the value, I guess, in being part of a centre like this an innovation centre, which is all around how do we bring companies in and how do we help to accelerate the growth that they need to go through. Um, I guess the other piece of, of that project as well is that, you know, how can we bring in, um, how can we create a support infrastructure for individuals that want to graduate um, in the game space and go and create their own startup. And that comes back to this ecosystem that I'm talking about, which is supporting SKC games with their vision, but then creating some smaller organizations in that startup space to come in and uh, provide um, support for the bigger vision that we have with SKC games. So I'll, I'll probably wrap up there because I'm conscious that we've, I think Tim, we're running a little bit over time, aren't we? Uh, no, you're all right for a few minutes. If you want to just carry on, that's fine. Okay. Um, so, so with um, with the work that we're doing here, I mean, the Oxford Innovation Centres are all about supporting um, early stage companies, and so many of the centres have um, innovation directors uh, rightly um, based at the centre because we recognise that a key part of growth for startups is, is not necessarily you know, people like Acer come in and they have brilliant ideas of what they want to do. And, and, but they are very focused on the space that they're in. And for a successful, uh, for companies to be successful, they need more than that. They need support with raising investment. And, you know, Hayden touched on that earlier already. They need um, support with creating the right infrastructure 
um, you know, they need all this, this heap of other functions within a business that need to be fulfilled for that company to be successful. And so working with ASA, it gives me the opportunity to help provide some of that support. And if I can't help them directly, then I can certainly go away and find somebody who can. So right now we're in the middle of seeing whether we can get uh, the investment in place, see whether we can get the motion capture studio uh, investment in place for that um, facility to be built here. And then at the same time, we see um, whether there's a, a, an appetite for a games accelerator that will create here for startups as well on the top floor at the upper centre. Yeah, exactly. And I think, I think just, just to sort of add to that, one of the important things about these programmes and networks is while we may all operate in very different um, industries, um, a lot of the technology that we're all using or we're all working towards all have a very similar application. So if you take the scenario that we're doing in terms of our artificial intelligence um, project, we are using, we've got some great people that are working in the game space, but we're also looking to collaborate with other people outside of the game space, also working on machine learning technology, because a lot of that work that they're doing really can complement what we're doing and vice versa. So again, you know, having these sort of networks, you know, if there's people that are working in that space, then you know we want to talk to them, and, and no doubt they might want to talk to us as well. So and then that, that works that works works great. And you know we've we've with SKT Games, we we picked the epicenter. We didn't pick the epicenter because of the the business support programs. We didn't know until we came to the place that they had it. But oh my goodness, it's been one of the best things for us since we've got here because um, it's really taken an element away from myself. Uh, when you're starting a new business, you're an entrepreneur. You wear so many hats. CEO, CTO, Chief Operating Officer, Project Manager, Doer, Coder, you name it, even T-Boy, you do the lot. And it becomes incredibly challenging and time consuming. And having that business support there really does take some of the, the, those pressures away. And it also helps you understand yourself, um, what your own personal strengths and weaknesses are. You know, and because of that, you know, I've, I've kind of looked for certain types of skills where we've got gaps in our knowledge within our studio. And you know, for me, I'm, I'm a technology guy. You know, my, I've always been the chief operating officer or chief technology officer, but you know, I, I, I very, I've only occasionally stepped into the managing director role of this project. I'm, I'm the CEO. But, but you know, we're, 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 we're smart, we're intelligent, we've got a great team. And you know, we know that actually probably my, my best position in the organization is CTO. And actually, you know, we're currently looking for a CEO to come in and, and maybe steer the ship because so that we can focus more on the technology side and our innovation. Um, and I think sometimes when you're sort of like a, an entrepreneur starting a business, you, you have to understand what, what, what you're trying to achieve and where your strengths and weaknesses are and, and lean on the support and the people around you that, that are there are, and are willing to help you. I think just to add to that as well is that when you're on the journey, um, it gets tough. And especially, you know, if you're looking to do a raise, you know, they get, you get to a point where you start to question what you're doing. So, so you know, staying true to, to your idea and, and, and the business you want to create and over time is being able to deliver that with a level of conviction, regardless of the feedback you might be getting from external people, potential investors and all of that stuff, I think is a really big piece of it as well. Yeah, definitely. And I think I just want to add, as it was mentioned before, that you know, when you when you talk to mentors or you get people that will say, yeah, let take me through your pitch, let me let's understand it, I can give you some feedback, you will get people that will contradict each other all the time. And what you end up going, as I have, the hard way, is that actually your your pitch really needs to be directed at the audience that you're you're directing it at. Because not all two investors are the same. And they might want the same goals, but in terms of what it is they're looking at, it's different. So it is really, really important to try and understand who it is that you're actually pitching to and have a good selection of slides that you can drop in and out depending on the content you think that they're actually interested in, in listening in. And it's not that mentors are, are wrong, it's just they're looking at, at different views and uh, they're through different lenses. I think, I mean, that's a great point. So I think. Um, uh, it's kind of uh, yeah. We we could uh, be so we can probably plug something that's coming up next next spring around that space, which is you know trying to really look at how we get more a wider range of investors, especially you know 
across around the Cambridge cluster and over to Oxford and within the east of England, you know, really kind of pointed at businesses and startups here very much, I think, on that basis. You want a diverse range of investors with lots of different types of individuals with different interests to, to get an, a vibrant ecosystem, right? You can't, you can't just have one or two conversations. You need to have lots. You need to tune your presentation to that particular audience or if it's an angel group, possibly to that what that group has set itself out. I mean, this is a key thing, right? For it is, absolutely. And I always say, um, whenever you are looking at working with any investor, do your due diligence on the investor. You know, it's equally important that you interview them to make sure they're the right investor for you. There are, you know, the, the, the process itself is time consuming for sure, but finding the right investor is hugely, hugely important because they'll make the right introductions, they'll operate at the right level, they'll get involved at the right level. You know, I've heard some nightmare stories around, uh, you know, where, where that hasn't worked out and, um, and, and it's just not worth it. So, so yeah. spend the time, do the due diligence, work out the right investor, and at work, as, as Tim said, we um, it's a little bit early to share, but we'll be doing some work here um, in March next year where we are looking to attract a wide range of investors um, and we'll be looking to put forward some companies as part of that pitching process. Um, right. So, yeah. yeah, super important stuff. Uh, bad investor startup is like worse than a bad marriage or it can be. So, <laughs> um, but no, great. Yeah, I have to say, though, that um, the investors that we have in SKC Games have all been brilliant. They've actually been so supportive and, and, and very patient because, you know, that project's taken time to do because, you know, there, there's been challenges on the road. And I think that what we've just said about, you know, if you get to know your investor, you know, before they put the money in there and, and really have a good relationship with them, it makes running your business a lot easier. OK, that's cool. So... A really big takeaway from that presentation, which was brilliant, thank you both, was, and I think building extremely well on what Hayden was saying, you ha as an entrepreneur, you have to be focused, but you can, if you can leverage an incubator or an, a hub, the, there's a whole wraparound service there that you perhaps didn't appreciate existed. And it seems that, you know, in Norfolk and Suffolk, our current generation of hubs, uh, of which Epicenter is one, you know, there's Hethel, there's Innovation Martlesham, we'll be hearing from Innovation Labs a bit later. The good ones really, really do support the businesses in a bespoke way. It's not just about collecting rents and membership and telling people about what events are going on. It's, it's really about helping those businesses on their growth journey. So. Um, thank you very much, both of you, and uh, look forward to hearing more about SKC Game Studio and uh, just, you know, it's very exciting. So uh, next up, we have from Uniotech, Michael Price. Here's Michael. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to attempt to share my slides quickly, Let's see if this works. Looking good. Okay. Excellent. I'll yeah, great. Cool. So, um, good morning, everyone. My name is Michael. Um, I'm the CEO of Uniotech. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we've been innovating with LoRaWAN technology. So, quickly, a little bit about us. Um, we're a small team, four of us at the moment, um, and we provide IoT sensor networks um, to help people collect data from hard to reach places. So, places where Wi-Fi or cellular signals might not, uh, might not reach or might not be cost effective. Um, we offer solutions that go from a single sensor right up to smart cities. And the data from that is key to helping people make better decisions. So you can see a few of the, the customers that we've, we've worked with recently on projects here. Um, key ones, Norfolk County Council and Suffolk County Council have been really supportive. So we'll talk a little bit more about them as we go on. So why LoRaWAN technology? So, well, first of all, um, it's a, a great system. So LoRaWAN stands for Long Range Wide Area Network. And some of the key features here are it's really low power technology. So these devices typically battery powered. 
Um, they can run from a single AA size battery for up to 10 years. Um, they're long range. So the, the signal from these um, has got really good uh, anti-interference capabilities. So it can, it can get through uh, walls. Um, you can have sensors in, in buildings that are connecting to gateways several kilometers away. Um, as an example, we've got a gateway on the top of County Hall in, in Norwich, which uh, has a range that goes all the way out to the coast, down past Long Stratton, all of Norwich is covered by that gateway. So a really well-placed gateway can have a fantastic um, coverage. There's a huge range of sensors available as well. So you're not tied to a couple of devices from a couple of manufacturers. Um, there's open standards in, in LoRaWAN, so any manufacturer can uh, can decide to use the technology and, and create a, a device. So there's a range of things from mouse traps we've got on the screen here, service buttons, GPS trackers, flood sensors, street light controllers, temperature sensors, or pretty much anything you can think of. If it can send a small packet of data, um, there's a LoRaWAN sensor for it. Flexibility. Um, Something you don't get from uh, using cellular data networks, if you decide to use SIM cards and a mobile operator, you're tied to their coverage. So if, uh, if your mobile network operator doesn't have coverage where you want to put a sensor, then there's not a lot you can do about it. Uh, LoRaWAN's great that you can either join a public network, um, we'll talk about the uh, Norfolk and Suffolk Innovation Network in a bit, but you can also build your own network. So if you want to have a completely private network that's just for your devices, you can deploy your own gateways. If not, you can connect to a public network like the one across Norfolk and Suffolk, or you can do a combination of the two and there's roaming available between networks as well. So um, devices can roam across the public and private networks all over Europe as well. And it's secure. The traffic's encrypted end-to-end -end from the device all the way up to the, the application server. So you know that you've got uh, good security. There's a whole load of um, processes built into it to prevent any sort of replay attacks or um, man in the middle style, style attacks as well. So the system is very robust and secure. So how does it work? So each of those devices communicates with one or preferably multiple gateways. Um, the traffic's asymmetric, so the majority of the data is uplinks from devices, but you can also send downlink packets to them as well. Um, LoRaWAN devices come in in a couple of different uh, flavors. So there's uh, class A devices, which wake up at a certain point. So maybe a sensor has been activated or you've asked it to notify you every 10 minutes of the river level. The device will wake up, read its sensors, and send the data, and then it listens for a, a very short period for a reply from the network. If it doesn't hear anything, it just goes back to sleep and it will wake up again next time it needs to. Um, so that little window is your chance to send it a downlink command, which could be updating its configuration. You can even do firmware updates over, over the network as well if you need to. The other type of device is a class C device, which is always listening. So these are typically mains powered things. Um, the street lighting controller is the, the typical one we go for here that it's got a power supply all the time and so we can then have the radio on it's in very low power consumption mode but because you're not on battery it doesn't doesn't matter how how much you're using there and that device then can be sent data um, and commands immediately so you can turn the light on and off in almost real time so the gateways um, forward the packets on so they receive the small packets from the device and forward that onto a network server and the network server deals with um, deduplicating the data. So if your device is received by multiple gateways, like they are in Norwich, um, only one packet will get forwarded on to, the, to your application. And it also deals with which gateway is closest to your device and best place to send any downlink messages to it. And as I mentioned previously, all of the packets are end-to-end -end encrypted. So we know that we've got security there. So what can you do with this technology? Well, there's a whole range of opportunities. Um, I'm going to talk about a few of them. Um, Kurt from Norfolk County Council is going to talk um, after this about um, the innovation network and some of the applications that um, Norfolk County Council have, have come, come up with and, and things that we've worked with them on. So I'll talk about a bit more generally what, what could be possible for um, organisations in, well, across the UK, but particularly in Norfolk and Suffolk, 
so we can take advantage of um, the innovation network. So from a smart building point of view, we offer meeting room occupancy, desk occupancy sensors, quite topical at the moment, CO2 level monitoring. Um, we can tell you whether your heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems are operating correctly. We've got demand driven cleaning systems. So we have sensors on um, toilet doors and uh, in communal areas that then uh, inform the cleaning staff where their services are required. So you're not cleaning a, an area that hasn't been used and high touch areas and, and highly used areas get extra. We do utility metering, um, which is great for um, sub metering of uh, like shared office spaces. You can even uh, go for a bit of gamification on this, try and get people to drive down their consumption by having a leaderboard within your, in your office space. We do service on demand. So there's a little picture on the bottom of the slide here of a, um, a call point button. We have these installed in communal areas and office blocks to allow people to, to notify the um, building managers when something needs doing. So in, in our office here, we have them for topping up the tea and coffee, which is uh, very widely used. Sends a text message then to the building manager who uh, comes and uh, tops it up for you. And predictive maintenance. So there's sensors that can be attached to things like lift motors and HVAC systems that will monitor the performance of that machinery and alert you um, if anything unusual occurs. So you can start to see when an unusual vibration um, starts to be detected in motors. That's normally a, a good indication that it's going to fail soon. Uh, allows you to um, arrange service calls and fix that equipment before it becomes a problem. Flood monitoring is a really big area of interest as well. Um, We've got a range of different sensors with different technologies, um, from radar and, and laser sensors to the ultrasonic one that you can see on here. And these can be installed. We've got them installed with the Broads Authority on uh, various bridges in, in Norfolk. Um, and we also do ones that are installed in, in sewers for um, blockage detection and prevention. So they, they can integrate directly with pumping stations and automated control valves that allows you to rather than just report that there is a flooding incident about to happen, you can actually take some action um, autonomously to, to mitigate that risk um, and hold water further up the system um, and allow you a bit of time to, to resolve the issue before it needs clearing. Footfall counting is really popular. So we've got a project with Norfolk Trails Network um, and Broadland District Council at the moment. This picture is on one of their new country parks. Um, so these devices are great for, for monitoring who or how many people are using your facility, great for tourist attractions as well. Um, battery powered again, lasts for several years on, on a um, set of AA batteries. And they monitor the number of people that pass in each direction and report that back over the LoRaWAN network to our software platform. Waste bin monitoring. So we've all seen uh, overflowing bins in busy areas. You also have the, the converse of that is um, councils are spending a lot of time and effort visiting bins in laybys and remote locations, which maybe don't need emptying. And so these sensors will monitor the level of waste in a bin, report when they need emptying. They integrate with some uh, very clever route planning software that will allow you to um, route your uh, collections appropriately. And it uses uh, some machine learning to identify when bins are likely to fill up. So how often, how they, their fill rates typically over a period of time. Um, and it will allow you to proactively plan for collections. They also have temperature sensors for fire detection and tilt sensors. So if the bins have been knocked over or vandalized, you know about it as well. Um, we've been doing some work with Great Yarmouth Borough Council on uh, potentially installing these in some of their seafront locations to help, um, particularly in the summer season when things fill up really quickly give a better service for um, the public using the areas, but also more effective for them that they don't spend all day driving around looking for bins that may or may not be full. Asset tracking is a really interesting one. So the, the Norfolk and Suffolk Innovation Network covers a, a large proportion of Norfolk and Suffolk at the moment. So I mean, if you've got machinery, trailers, vehicles, even livestock that you want to keep track of, these low power um, devices are great value. You can connect them um, to the network for free. Um, 
and they have a whole range of configuration options you can set um, working hours and speed limits so you can be notified if your um, your equipment is moved outside normal working hours or your vehicles are speeding over <laughs> in particular areas they're really small battery powered i've had one of these on the dashboard of my car um, running for nearly two years now um, without changing the batteries uh, it reports while i'm driving around um, every minute where my location is we use that to to help map the the actual real world coverage of the innovation network as you can see in the screenshot this is where i or I drove around in uh, in Horsford the other day on my way to a meeting. Another really interesting opportunity, smart street lighting. I mentioned this for the, the Class C devices earlier. Um, almost all the street lights um, deployed in the UK have the same uh, connector on the top of them for a dust till dawn sensor. And it's really easy to swap that for a, a LoRaWAN device and make that a smart street light. So um, these devices monitor the energy consumption, they detect faults with the lights, and they allow um, a much more detailed control of the, uh, of the fittings and the schedule for them. So we can create groups of lights, um, assign them a specific schedule, dimming patterns, and then you can override that. So for example, if you had a, um, a major event on somewhere, you could decide that for that event, you want brighter lights on the roads around that area. So you can override the profile just for that particular period of time, maybe for an hour or two after the event, um, and then drop back down to your normal levels again. The benefit of the energy monitoring here is you can, you can detect when lights are on all day, um, where there's been a fault and they're wasting energy, but also street lights are normally billed as an unmetered um, supply. So the, uh, the distribution network operator for the electricity in, in the area will make an assumption about how much that light uses and charge the um, local authority appropriately. Um, whereas that doesn't take into account any energy saving measures they've got with timings um, or dimming profiles. Whereas this system allows us to monitor the exact energy consumption and you can be billed for exactly what you've used and no, um, no additional stuff. So uh, rattle through that just in time I think but Kurt has got some some more use cases coming up in his slides which which we've been working on um, so the Norfolk and Suffolk Innovation Network has been um, key to the success of our business um, we started um, the company based on um, some use cases the Norfolk County Council presented to uh, to a community group that I was involved with um, so road temperature monitoring for for winter gritting was our our first project and that's really um, kicked off the, the whole of our, our business our, um, and led to a whole load of other projects with other local authorities. So um, we'll hand over to Kurt in a moment who will talk about a bit more about this. If anybody is interested in uh, learning a bit more about LoRaWAN technology or how it might, how it might be useful to your, your organization, um, do drop me an email, I'll put my, uh, I put the website and uh, my LinkedIn in the chat in a minute. I'm uh, happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much, Michael. Um, again, I think we, we can take questions in the in the uh, in the panel a bit later. But no, brilliant explainer. I think uh, it's the best explainer I've had of what a LoRaWAN network actually is. Is it, you've explained IoT, what that kind of means, um, and you know, again, picking up the convergence between things like sensors, networks, artificial intelligence and machine learning, you know, many of these other technologies kind of coming together. Um, but um, I'm gonna pass over now to Kurt, um, who's very kindly agreed to join us from Norfolk County Council. And Kurt and I have spoken on a couple of conference platforms in the last, in the last month. Uh, we were at Talking Tech. It was really great to meet Kurt properly at Talking Tech and hear about what's going on and was very inspired to hear about the Norfolk and Suffolk Innovation Network. So Kurt, over to you. Thank you, Tim. And, and I'm really glad to be here. So um, it's great to hear from Michael because he's one of the really good success stories that have come out of a project that originally and is funded by the Local Enterprise Partnership, the local LEP. So um, that, that's one of the reasons why we have rolled out this large network 
Um, but I'm going to show you some of the, rather than talk about the network too much, I'm going to show you some of our use cases, as Michael said, um, uh, around this technology, because some of them really are interesting and they could be game changers. But while I'm talking, I think for the audience, the, the one thing for me that jumps out is this is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for local businesses to either experiment with this technology to see if they can create a business out of it, to use the technology to improve their already commercial offerings or to innovate. So that's what, how we see it in terms of uh, public sector using this network, but local businesses can sell to businesses, you know, they can create dashboards and stuff. So let me try and bring it to life for you a bit. But just to recap, it's the Norfolk and Suffolk Innovation Network and the top left there is, is a map of Norfolk and all those purple lines are sensors talking to gateways. So it's here, it's now, we're still rolling out, it's getting bigger and bigger, it should cover all of Norfolk and Suffolk. But as you can see, you can put a sensor in Great Yarmouth or, or Norwich and that'll send that data 25 miles to wherever the gateway is and you can, you can gather that data and do something with it. Um, I just thought I'd quickly show you where some of the gateways are. As you can see, they're all over the region, where these lightning bolts are, are where the gateways are. So if you were to put a sensor in Great Yarmouth, that's got several gateways that could send that data to. So it's got an inbuilt resilience. Um, and Michael's already talked about how it works. Sensors sending data to a gateway, and then that data being accessible either over the internet or on a dashboard. But let's get into the meat of it. So. Um, on the left here, we've got a load of deployed, so these are things that are real and live and working use cases, uh, ranging from winter gritting, where we're monitoring the temperature in the roads, and I'll talk a bit about more of that, all the way down to our latest, most exciting project around adult social care, where we monitor people to help them live independently longer. In the middle, there's other use cases that are under investigation. And what we mean by that, that is we're actively working on them to see if there's a, a business case for delivering them. And on the right, when we've talked to many people about the projects we want to run, these are other ideas. Um, there's many more than this, but these are ones that are bubbled to the top because they have particular uh, uh, things that we, we need to address. I'll give you an example on there, bridge, bridge stress monitoring. Apparently we get a lot of people driving into bridges or on the broads, we get people who try to get their boats under bridges and get the heads stuck between the boat and, and the bridge because they underestimate how to get through, which is a health and safety issue. But generally there's a lot going on. So our real first one was when we started rolling out the network and we worked with Michael, um, to put sensors, if you look at the image at the top right, the, the temperature sensors in, in the highway to monitor road temperature. And we, we've been using this for the last two years. So we've put a number of sensors out there. What they do is tell us whether we're getting there freezing and they help inform the decisions around do we send our gritting lorries out. Now, what's interesting about this story is we already did that. We already had a system. And the, the, the weather stations that we used, there were six around the county. So for all of Norfolk, there were six. And they cost us, um, it cost us £3.4 million a year to do the to our gritting run. But the, the, um, those sensors cost about 25 to 30K per sensor. These ones that we've put in the ground, you know, we're talking a couple of hundred pounds. So there was a big saving, but also it gave us more data. So instantly that said, there was, there was an opportunity for both us to improve our services but as I said, more importantly, for a local business to support us doing something different to innovate and hopefully to build a business on, on the back of it or provide services to other businesses in the region. So we jump from that first use case to this one. This, this is what we call Project Natalie. Uh, it's Norfolk Assistive Technology Application for Living Independently. Basically, how are we going to take the pressure off the system where we've got a growing older population and um, they use all the different services that we have from the health service to adult social services and it's a growing challenge. Let me put that into context. We spend £1 million a day on adult social care. That's a big number. The population's um, getting older and we've got people migrating into Norfolk to retire. With pe people in housing, um, uh, with, with care, 
we've got a lot of residents, but traditionally the technology we've used to assist people has, has uh, uh, historically been disparate and not worked very well together. Yeah. Um, so here's some numbers about that, but the reality is, you know, look, 20,000 people received short and long-term care packages in Norfolk every year. And we've got a growing, growing population getting older, and we predict by 2030, there'll be 274,000 people that need help. And then, and then we look at the 85 uh, age bracket and 77% of them um, over the same period. So they're big numbers, big money, and a big problem. Um, so our vision for the project is let's support people to live independently longer. Let's not get them into the system that early. You know, let's try and keep them out of the system. Can we take the strain off the support services using this tech? Um, can we enable trusted family and friends to help them? And also, if we're, if we're using data, can we aggregate it and inform our services so we know when to intervene? Um, but my favourite bit is, can we innovate around this, this service? So here's some sensors that we've put into uh, people's homes. We've started with our staff um, and then we've now moved on. So this is a live project onto into some real, real service users. So we've got environment sensors, motion, light, temperature. These are the sort of sensors Michael was talking about for some of the other applications. Um, we can tell whether doors are open and closed and medicine cupboards and, and boxes. Um, is the kettle been put on? How, what time is the kettle been put on and temperature? So anything you think you can monitor, we can. So we've put this group, this, these are the specific ones we've put in people's homes. And it's got really interesting. So Ali Cubit won't mind me sharing this. I've talked to him about that. So we put some in his house. He's, he's a guy who works for me. And as you can see, we were starting to monitor and getting this type of data out of it. Then we were... Uh, looking at the data in a different way and that was showing us on what dates you can see things pulsing on and off in terms of room occupancy where where he would spend most of his time and this led on our journey to a, a live pilot where we've got all of these sensors in someone's home and it's helping us understand what they do so now i'll give you an example of this obviously we have to get their permission to to monitor of course we do but the the, the example is if someone normally gets up and puts the kettle on by nine o'clock in the morning. And that's their regular pattern. If we apply machine learning to the data and then they don't one day, we could automatically inform a trusted member of the family or a friend to pop round or give them a call to check they're okay. Now, the earlier we intervene on things when things go wrong, the less likely people are to go into the, the other systems. So that's an exciting project called Natalie, but obviously from us, we're a county council, we're not in the business of providing sensors, we're not in the business of creating all this, this uh, collecting this data and put it on dashboards. What we want is the information so we can improve our services, and that's where there's a great opportunity for businesses in the region to, to get involved in some of the things we want to do to innovate. Um, and, and as you can see, I've, I've put it on a slide for anybody who wants the slides afterwards so they can see what we're, we, we, we think we're doing with this data. Now, let's jump from there to somewhere else. So uh, you may have heard of Ben Burgess, a big agricultural uh, company that provides things like tractors to the farming community. They've jumped on the network. And this map on the left is showing where they've got sensors in farms in the region, in Norfolk. Um, providing data, so there's the sensor, providing data to farmers and they're putting it in their hands in, in an iPhone application so they can tell when to spray their crops, spray their apples. So, you know, they, they're looking at precipitation, air temperature, um, dew point, etc. So I'm not a farmer. However, I believe I understand this is very useful to them. So Ben Burgess is following us around as we roll out the network and they got this app, app up and running within six weeks. They already had those sensors I showed you, but they didn't have the, the mechanism to get the data from the sensors into the, into the, the app. So they, they've developed this with a company and now farmers are actually using that live. Other things we're doing are monitoring our buildings and our community hubs and providing graphical dashboards like this to show, um, uh, show uh, humidity, damp and things like that. And as you can see, there's more and more data coming out. And what we're trying to do is make this data public where possible, you know, where, where, where we're allowed to. So then people can, can do other things with it. This is County Hall pre-pandemic. That center on the right is something that Michael Price, who spoke earlier, gave me to put under these desks. So we can 
monitor whether they're free or busy. So this was a mock-up trial of desk monitoring. And funny that now the pandemic's over, we're now thinking, well, we need to monitor desks so we people can book them when they come back into the office. Um, and another thing we did um, during the pandemic, we had to stand up a temporary mortuary unfortunately, at RAF Coltishola, which is now called Scotto. And uh, we didn't have the connectivity there to monitor the temperature in that mortuary. So we used this technology to get that implemented within five to six weeks. It's a really good success story there. Um, other things we're doing, there's uh, only a few more that I was going to share today. So there's um, the police has asked us to look at electric fences because when they fail, um, livestock gets on the road and we've had fatalities in Norfolk when this happened. So we want to be able to provide some uh, some farmers some sensors they can plug into their, their electric fences and when they're off, broken, cut, they, they're made aware of them. So that's one thing we're looking at, but the, the, this is a growing area. Agritech and using this technology um, uh, is, is very underused and, and we're now looking at working with some of the county farms to put this technology in place. We've got, had three farmers, new farmers, have approached us to say, can we put stuff on their farms? Including when we plant trees, uh, to monitor them, to make sure that they're growing correctly, because we've committed to plant a million trees over the next five seasons. But my most favourite one is this one. This is uh, Gresson Hall Rural Life Museum and on the left is a map where I've walked around with a sensor and then we've given it to staff to monitor where people go, are they finding all the exhibits and are they actually staying there for any period of time. This informs the service so they can improve what they do there. So that's it, that's all the use cases. Um, some of these, we're happy if, if people want to contact us and say we'd like to have a, a crack at doing that one or getting involved with that one. Or if you just want to find out more about the technology, you can either look at these slides. So I've put some links on here. Uh, that's Alex Cliff from Highways, do the Highways bit. But if you click on these, they'll take you to videos to tell you what we're doing, how to get involved. But if not, please come and speak to me to find out more. There's my email, there's my LinkedIn and there's my Twitter. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. And um, yeah, if anyone if anyone wants to talk to Kurt and the team about the LoRaWAN network, the innovation network, um, they're a very friendly bunch. So uh, go go speak. But yeah, lots of great examples there. Um, I mean, I think you know, obviously, Kurt, you talk mainly about public sector uh, examples, uh, and and there is a theme here, isn't there, about you know, tech being used for good and for 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 for, for good uh, social uh, and sort of economic purpose, as well as for purely, uh, you know, pure, purely capitalist uh, money making uh, opportunities. So 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 we're glad to hear about that. Um, so thanks, Kurt. No, really, really good. Um, right, we are now on to the sort of final section of our. Um, uh, a sort of showcase of use cases and examples of entrepreneurs and, uh, and, and support organizations. And we have something slightly different for the last one. So we have Liz from Innovation Labs. Hi, Liz. And we, and, and, and we have, I think, three, uh, th uh, three, three speakers from Innovation Labs. Now, um, Liz will introduce Innovation Labs in a, se in a second. But for those of you who, who don't know what Innovation Labs is, I mean, we've been really pleased over the last um, 18 months to see the development of new innovation hubs and centers around um, East of England. Uh, we heard from Epicenter in Haverhill earlier and Innovation Labs, which started life in, in Stowe Market and is now kind of expanding. I'm sure we'll hear about more about that, uh, is, is, is another of these. And these hubs are, are, are different in nature. Some of them are, 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 are public sector owned. Some of them are purely private enterprises. Some of them are partnerships. Innovation Labs is one of the newest and most exciting and uh, Liz I'm going to hand over to you to talk a little bit about Innovation Labs and uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Fantastic thank you so much Tim and thanks Scott and Bridget um, for organising. So good morning my name is Liz Wilkins I'm the community manager here at the Innovation Labs based in Stone Market. We're more than co-working um, yes we have a co-working space um, but we are have been founded by a phenomenal team of entrepreneurs You've already met Hayden Allen Verco this morning and you've heard about Orbital Global and the work that they're doing with Vituri. Um, we were founded by Peter Brady, 
who is the founder and CEO of Orbital and Global and Futuri. And he was joined by Peter Basford and Hermione Way. And the four individuals behind the labs have created an ecosystem and a community of um, entrepreneurs where we really put the business at the heart of what we're trying to achieve here. Now I could prattle on for hours um, about how phenomenal they all are, but I'm not going to. Um, what I would like to do is share really what we're all about. So we launched in November 29. Um, I believe some of you may have had the privilege to have come to our launch party. Remember the days when we could all be in a big room together, um, stood next to each other without masks or um, anti-back. And we launched in November 29. And since then, despite the pandemic, we've been able to successfully grow um, through our innovation, um, enabling entrepreneurship. We've helped our businesses grow significantly and we've facilitated public and private sector partnerships between our members. And we've had some phenomenal feedback. Now I could read this slide out and I could, I could bore you to death with um, some phenomenal stories of innovation, but rather than me talk about what has been achieved, we've um, had the opportunity to invite three of our members to actually come on and join us. So um, I'm delighted to say that we've got Ben Catton from Altham Payments um, coming on to share shortly. Um, they're a fintech business. We've got Shamal Rajapaksi from Cap Certified, um, which is an edtech solution for protecting children online, and Garant Thomas from Guided Innovation, who's going to talk about care tech for the health and social care sectors. So. Without further ado, I'd like to hand you over to Ben Catton. Ben, you have the floor. Cool. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, let me share my screen. Oh, I think you have to unfair yours. Yeah, and I bear with me a second. There you go. Uh, Okay, cool. Uh, right, yeah, cool. So I've been um, working for Open Payments for about eight months now. Um, I basically graduated from oh, we're on, uh, I graduated from uni uh, university, uh, Coventry University, studying marketing. Um, and ever since then, I've been working here, um, working on some exciting projects in Stone Market for Open and also uh, the new app uh, called Echo Pay. Uh, that's a business to business payment app. Um, so first, I'm just going to start off a bit about Open. Um, so the main main purpose of our business is to reduce the costs that it takes for the card payments um, so in the hope to increase sales and improve profits. Um, our customer base is made up of £250 million pounds of card payments uh, processing a year um, that's, that's mainly made up of um, mainly made up of wholesalers. Um, we do this through merchant service reviews and uh, smart terminals, which uh, we reduce the costs uh, of, their, of our customer base of 400,000 annually. Um, but we want to take this one step further as we still think um, our customers are paying too much in card payment fees. Um, and that's why we created EchoPay. Um, it basically reduces cost further while also increasing security and improving cash flow because uh, the settlement is instant. Um, so yeah, this is a business to business payment app. Um, so the best way that I thought to show you how it works uh, would be just take you for a payment journey. Um, we've currently got one live on the App Store at the moment called uh, United Wholesale Scotland. Um, they, are, they turn over around £300 million pounds a year. Um, and basically we've created a bespoke app that's branded in with their logo um, that their customers are able to pay with. Um, they're able to pay in three different ways. Uh, the first one is literally the customer making a payment. This is allowing them to pay anywhere at any time for any amount. Um, and we found this to be one of the most popular ways that um, a customer, uh, that their customers want to pay with. Um, the second way is through a QR codes. Um, so the app is a built-in uh, QR code scanner uh, that we're able to display a QR code on an invoice at Till or on our new EchoPod system that's a payment terminal that uh, we can give to delivery drivers and that can also be um, put in stores. And then as well as an app, we also provide a dashboard um, for our customers that um, they're able to send uh, a payment request directly to the customer's phone that will come through as a notification. Um, both the QR code and the payment request are uh, automated. So the customer uh, doesn't have to type in any payment details. Um, so it makes it really easy um, and also frictionless. Um, so after the three payment methods, uh, identical screen so for this case the united wholesale it shows the branch uh, the account number and the amount and then also the payment type which is cash and off account 
Um, it's all it's basically identical for all three, um, making it easy and recognizable for the customer. Um, and then after that, um, it goes to the bank screen. Uh, so we've got over uh, 30 banks to choose from. Um, and this basically is where the customer uh, finds and locates their banks they use for online or mobile banking. And once selected, they'll be directed to their mobile banking app if they have it downloaded. But if they don't, they'll be taken to a the, um, their web browser where they can uh, securely log into their online banking. Um, so basically how it works is through an open banking payment initiation service technology. Um, and it's basically an API that calls, um, that Echo Pay calls um, to uh, the customer's bank um, that they then authorize the payment that then takes them back to Echo Pay for them to confirm the details and then authorize the payment. Um, so once that payment's been made, uh, the customer will get a confirmation uh, message on the app and they'll also receive an email and the business will also receive an email with um, all of the details. Uh, and so the branch that was made, uh, the account number, the amount and the payment type. Um, so this, the reason uh, this is better than just taking car payments is because the settlement is instant and there's no risk of chargeback uh, for the business. Um, it's completely secure because the payment journey is completely on the customer's phone. So no details are shared um, in the payment process. And it's also cost effective. Um, so it costs around 60% less than a car payment transaction would. Um, and yeah, so throughout the journey, uh, we've been working with the Innovation Lab um, while EchoPay has been in development and just kind of the feedback from other um, uh, businesses. So we've, there's, around us, we've got people from different um, backgrounds and who has different experiences that have been able to chip in with uh, helping the development of echo pay and getting um, kind of some feedback directly from other people um, regular mentoring for projects um, has given us a different viewpoint um, about projects and also uh, personal development as well and just uh, in general working with other members uh, great networking opportunities as well uh, meeting new different people um, who are maybe have similar businesses but also that are completely unrelated to what we do um, and then just the location, uh, we have a, our uh, app developer is in London um, and the transport connections. Uh, we're about two minutes walk away from the train station and about an hour and a half uh, to Liverpool Street. Uh, yeah, so thanks. Hope that kind of gives an overview of what we do. Um, I've got uh, LinkedIn uh, if you want to do the networking, as I just said. But yeah, that's it. Thank you. Well, that was a whistle stop tour, Ben. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, um, thank you. And just hold that slide up, Ben, because uh, in case people want to just scan mm. that uh, that code for your LinkedIn. Um, brilliant. Liz, back to you. Thanks, Tim. So next up we have Shamal. So Shamal, if you want to take, come to the stage. You have the floor. Thank you. Um, have I not enabled? Can you see me? Not yet. We can't no. see you. We can see your slides, but not your face. All oh, right. Okay. Hey. There. there you are. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Shamal Rajabox. Uh, I'm here to talk about CAP, a tech startup I co founded in 2019. We are a pre-revenue social enterprise on a mission to keep children safe online. So, um, sorry, I should have clicked this button. So, yeah, CAP stands for Child Authentication and Protection. And that's what we do. CAP is a community-led technology solution. It all started because of my son. It was uh, 2018, last day before school, summer holidays. On the way, on the way back, my son asked, if I could play Fortnite with his friends. He was just under six, six years old. Um, I said, yes, I didn't know what it was, uh, what Fortnite was. So I came home and did some research before downloading it. I learned that it was not suitable for children under 12. He had to wait another seven years. I also learned that Fortnite was teaming with online predators. As you can imagine, my son wasn't happy. He wanted to be cool like his friends and he, he didn't let it go. So I called a couple of dads to see how they have allowed their children to play on Fortnite. One child was using their dad's account and the other was using a fake account the parent has created. So I, I searched 
for other solutions. There must be other technical solutions, I thought. There are content filters, parental controls that block content and sites, and screen time management tools, but none that's stopped kids from falling prey to groomers hiding behind fake accounts. That's when I realized there was a gap in the market. I explained to my son why he couldn't play Fortnite, not, uh, Fortnite now, or even after he turned 12, for that matter. I promised him that I'd find a way for him and his friends to play safely when they were old enough. So this is the problem. This is how a multiplayer game or a social media platform look like today. The child can interact with anyone. Anyone can approach a child. As a parent, we don't know who our children play with, chat with, follow or being followed. I thought of sharing some stats at this age with you to show how bad the situation is, but you'd forget them by the end of this presentation. So last night I decided to give four and a half minutes of my uh, the time allocated to me to this video, the video created by our charity partner, the Breck Foundation. It's rated 15 and contains upsetting scenes. Essex Police Emergency. Okay. Uh, hello. Um, I need police and a forensic team to my address, please. What do you mean? What's happened? My friend and I got into an altercation and I am the only one who came out alive. Are you telling me you've killed somebody? I first met Lewis online. He's my friend. Lewis is my friend. Lewis is my friend. Lewis is a mate. Lewis is my friend. Lewis is Bragg's friend. He runs the fastest FPS server I've ever seen. The guys and I play Battlefield with him every day. He's an awesome programmer. He's an awesome programmer. He is an awesome programmer. He's an awesome programmer. He's a good programmer. Lewis lives in New York and has his own apartment. Lewis says he works for the government. Lewis works for, Lewis the, works government. for the government. Lewis works for the government. Lewis works for the government. Lewis runs his own business. He says I should quit school and start my own company. He says I've got the right sort of mind. Lewis is a millionaire. Lewis is a millionaire. Lewis is a millionaire. Lewis is a millionaire. <laughs> Lewis is a liar. Lewis says my friends are talking about me behind my back. He says that someone with a brain like mine is wasted on people like them. I'm going to be a programmer like Lewis. Lewis is a liar. Liar. Lewis is a liar. Lewis is OK. Mum and Dad say they're going to take my computer away. They say Lewis is dangerous. We've been friends for over a year now. Lewis says they can't do that. Lewis says they're trying to control me. Lewis is a liar. Liar. Lewis is a liar. Lewis is controlling my son. Lewis says he's ill and... He needs to hand over his company to me, but we need to meet. He says he'll pay for the taxi. Lewis says I'm really gifted and he trusts me. Lewis is a liar. Liar. Lewis is a liar. Lewis is a liar. 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 Lewis is a liar. liar. Lewis is my friend. Are you telling me you've killed somebody? Yes, I am. On the 17th of February, 2014, Lewis Danes an online friend who Breck believed was a real friend, lured him to his flat, where he was brutally murdered. We tried to convince him that he was in danger. If only Breck had believed us, my beautiful boy would still be alive today.
Hi. Um, I hope you could hear that too. Right. It's a, it's a it's difficult not to be moved by that. We have to take this problem seriously. We need to carry on and act fast. We can't we can't identify everyone online, but we can identify children online. We believe that identifying children as real children is the key to protect them online. That's the concept driving our technology. So in a nutshell, this is how CAP works. CAP enables parents to authenticate their children with the support of schools. They can then, the parents can then verify the children's individual social media and gaming accounts, set safety preferences for each of those accounts. Not only that, parents can also manually verify adults and organizations safety interact with their child because uncles and aunts, older siblings and organizations can't be authenticated by schools. Finally, CAP enables digital platforms to create a walled garden for those authenticated children. So this is how CAP has enabled the same social media platform that you saw earlier to create a safer environment for the children using their platform. Children can't cross paths with predators, groomers, scammers, and even bullies hiding behind fake accounts. But an older sibling or non-adults can interact with the child as long as they have parental permission to do so via CAP. I have to stress that we don't share any information with the platforms. CAP is a tokenized system, so we don't hold children's data and children's privacy is protected all time. If you remember at the beginning, I mentioned that CAP is community-led technology. That's because we need schools, parents, and digital platforms to work together to make this happen. This is where store market innovation labs come in. I'm, I'm quite so grateful to them, uh, to the team at the labs for the help they have given us so far. I'm grateful for all the introduction they have made for getting us on the East Anglian Daily Times for the opportunities like this one to raise awareness most importantly for the community they have created with like-minded entrepreneurs. CAP is MVP ready. We have trials, the co-authentication technology with a couple of schools successfully. We have a small team of four trademarked and patent pending. We're currently looking for funding and working to build our community with schools, social media platforms and multiplayer games. So if you want to know more, if you share your, our purpose, if you can help with connections to schools and digital platforms, please get in touch. This QR code will get you to my LinkedIn page, or you can visit capcertified.com. You'll also be helping me to keep the promise that I have made to my son. Take care. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Jamal. Very good, very powerful, uh, and a real reminder of the, um, the downsides of innovation. Um, uh, safety, security, particularly for young people and vulnerable people, uh, always has to be borne in mind. And um, I mean, we've talked today mainly about the positives and uh, CAP certified is a positive story, right? So you're doing some fantastic work. Uh, I'm sure there'll be lots of people who'll be very interested in, in finding out more. Um, so, uh, and hopefully you can stick around for our, our, our panel a little bit later, Shamal, but um, thank you very much. Thank you, thanks for the opportunity. And now I think we have, last but not least, Geraint. Uh, hi everybody, so yeah, I'm up next, but just after that, anybody else wanna go instead? No? All right, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go with that one. You've got, you've got a tough slot, Geraint. Brilliant, Geraint, wonderful. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, would would anybody would somebody mind making me spotlight? Um, I don't have a presentation, but it'd be nice if if I I I've kind of got attention on me. Is that all right? Can everybody see me? Yeah, we can see you. You're a spotlight. Yeah, can you see the nose hairs? Because I really have spotlighted and everything. No, okay, okay. Um, hi everybody. So my name's Guy Thomas. I founded a company called Guided Innovation Limited. We try and inspire social care organizations to solve their problems using cool tech. And there's a lot of cool tech out there um, that the sector I love just is not aware of. Likewise, there's a lot of really bad technology out there. 
um, which my sector tends to suffer from procuring by mistake. Um, so I am geek. I'm very much a geek. Uh, I, I love the latest technologies, particularly ones that aren't invented yet. Um, I'll just quickly say, for the example, artificial intelligence, I don't believe is invented yet. I think machine learning is very capable. If you ask a piece of machine learning a question, they're going to give you a very probable answer. If you ask a artificial intelligence a question, the only answer they should be giving is piss off. Uh, that's true intelligence. Um, in my opinion. And I, I try and demystify this for social care companies. Why social care? I could have chosen any other sector and earned more money, um, but uh, it, it's kind of where my heart is. So I work uh, in organizations and I set up about two years ago. Um, so I decided I need to help as many care companies as I possibly can. I couldn't do that employed by individual companies. So I set up my own company. Woohoo! Uh, I waved goodbye to sick pay and paid annual leave. Okay, it's fine, it's fine. But hey, I'm my own boss. I can do what I want. I can decide it, woohoo. Uh, COVID happened at me. Um, so that was a very challenging time. I worked in the sector, which suddenly meant I got very busy. The idea of furlough was a lovely idea for me, but um, it, it meant I got very busy. And, and the labs, uh, and I do work out of the innovation labs here in Stowe Market, was a bit of a lifeline for me. They enabled me to continue working through the pandemic as a key worker. and. It was quite profound, you know. Um, I stopped helping care companies get their payroll right, um, and instead worked. You know, I did an awful lot of work, sadly, around um, providing technology solutions so that people could say goodbye to their loved ones without going out to the care home because they were not allowed to go out and see them. Um, and suddenly, if you imagine some of the most vulnerable people with severe and acute autism or learning disabilities, a lot of their coping mechanisms is to go outside suddenly that was robbed from many of them across the UK. So again, I spent an awful lot of my time working with sensor technology and IoT. Uh, we equipped people's flats um, and bedrooms and apartments with sensor technology to alert us if anything was happening. And sadly, you know, if your coping mechanism is to go outside and you're only allowed to do it once a day, it meant, you know, there was a lot of behavioral challenges, a lot of people self-harming and injuries and, and things like that. So we did, we did an awful lot of work in that space, which was phenomenally rewarding. So what happened then, six months into setting up a company, deep in the middle of COVID, uh, a company looked over the fence and saw Guide Innovation. They were a consultancy that worked in restaurants and hospitality. So you can imagine how fun, much fun they were having during COVID. And they decided they needed a new vertical, social care and healthcare sounded a good one. So they procured my business. Woohoo! Uh, six months in, uh, I got my business bought and I suddenly became a director of a much larger organization. Um, and, and which worked with, with larger companies across different sectors, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Six months later, the founder of that other company became a millionaire overnight when he sold another company that he worked in. And waking with the knowledge that he didn't need to work anymore, he decided, I don't need to work anymore. Um, so he handed the company back to me um, and, I, and I moved it forward. So what happened then that was pivotal for me? I could have gone back into employed work. There was still innovation to be had in the sector. I still had that passion to work with as many care companies as I possibly could. So um, what I did is one thing I certainly learned, and that was I brought on a partner. I brought on another director to work with me. I gave some equity away and brought somebody else on the journey. And that was the smartest move I'd ever made. Uh, talk about great in the sum of your parts. Me and that other individual can achieve four people's work. We bounce off each other. It's somebody to check my thinking with. These big decisions for the sector, for technology, for my company, I can make with somebody, which was really, really empowering and fantastic. COVID tailed off. Things got a bit more relaxed. Um, technology got, got better. Uh, if you think about it, nobody used Zoom uh, or Microsoft Teams beforehand. Lots of care organizations didn't have intranets. They do now. Uh, and I, you know, I'm really lucky that I've been able to bring that to a lot of companies. Um, but now I'm getting to do more innovation. Uh, the company's grown. We've benefited from the UK government's kits, kickstart scheme quite severely. I've got three kickstarters with me at the moment. I'm hiring two more. Um, and you know, I've, I've grown now. I've got nine employees, which I couldn't have imagined. Um, oh crap! I've got nine employees. I've got a salary bill that I can't pay, that I, that I need to pay um, every month. So suddenly for the first time, my company has got to a position where I have to make a sale. Up till now, I've been, it's been nice to make a sale, but I've been able to bob along changing my salary in accordance with what I was doing. But now suddenly it's 
yeah, I've got to do it. And that's terrifying. So yeah, guided innovation is certainly at a pivotal point right now. Um, I'm overstretched. I've hired. I've got fantastic individuals working for me. Um, and we need more sales. So we're trying to work with more software companies, more startups, more um, tech firms to try and inspire them to actually, you know, don't, don't help Tesco's position there ice creams when the weather's hot. Uh, please use your innovations and data to help social care organizations so that fathers can get back to their families. Um, so yeah, that, that's the space I'm working in. Um, uh, a quick nod again to the Innovation Labs. I only came here for good coffee and Wi-Fi, uh, which I got, um, but I didn't I anticipate the importance actually of networking, of having mentors and people around you that know what they're doing. It's been phenomenal to have people around me that inspire me. So all the other entrepreneurs that are based here inspire me every time I speak to them. Um, and kind of the mentors that we have here at the labs, they've been really good. My worst thing, I'm very much, I like shiny things. I'm very much squirrel. Um, and they're very good at kind of going, hang on, hang on, hang on. <laughs> Bring it back. Does that help your business? Um, which is invaluable advice um, and things like that. But um, yeah, that, that's me. Um, it's been a pleasure having your attention for five minutes. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Geraint. Let me just see if I can. I can't start my video, Tim. So, but nobody needs to see my face. Um, it's all right. I'll see where I have to do that. <laughs> thank you. Um, so, thank you, Ben, Shamal, and Geraint for stepping in um, and and talking and really sharing about your businesses. But you know, we we do have more than three members. There's over 50 members of the Innovation Labs. Um, here are some of them on screen. And we've got some phenomenal success stories. Now, a couple of our members have been working on major product launches, um, one with a company based out of Silicon Valley. Um, not, it's not a fruit company, if you know the Forrest Gump reference, but it is a major tech company working on their product launch. We've had another one of our members working on the product launch for Sky Glass, which was announced a couple of weeks ago, which has been phenomenal. Um, Tim, you talked at the beginning about how the importance of um, robotics and surgery, DR UK, have done a, a world first. They've done some remote um, robotic surgical training um, and so a program for um, surgeons in the Caribbean, in Tr Trinidad and Tobago, um, so they can do laparoscopy. So that, I think that's the right pronunciation. Laparoscopy, I can't say it. Surgery where it's keyhole surgery. That's um, a better use. We've had um, Tom of Reset and Chill. Um, he pivoted his entire business at the start of the pandemic, and he was recently on the television um, showcasing his camper vans. Emily from Virtually Their Studio, who I believe is um, also with us today, has co-curated mixed reality exhibitions for local artists. Westview IT um, are winners of the Mid Suffolk and Baber Customer Service Award, and they've grown, um, their story is very similar to Geraint's. You know, they've grown from a team of one to a team of five since joining the labs, and they now have actually grown to the point where we've actually kicked them out, and they've got their own office space um, upstairs in Wolfside House. Um, Moss HR and Sasa Marketing have also relocated um, from working from home to brand new offices as a result of the business growth that they've achieved. Um, and one of our successes that you've probably already heard of is the virtual high street. It was created in response to the pandemic and within 90 days, Ellis of Q Technology launched a solution to help high street businesses go online. It's got, they've got over 350 businesses um, on the platform. It's um, across Stone Market, Sudbury, Hadley, Needham Market and I. And recently they won a public sector award for that project. Now, you may be thinking, well, that's all great, Liz, but, you know, how does, how does this all happen? Um, we have an online program. Um, obviously, you know, when the pandemic hit, um, people couldn't physically come to the space. So we um, ensured that all of our activity went online. We believe that it's really important for our members to practice public speaking. And thank you for giving us the opportunity all to practice our public speaking today, Tim. So we have Pitch Club on a Monday where you can um, practice your presentations. We have stand up calls on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, which is a rapid fire discussion. You get accountability, you get support, you get to hear what's going on across the network and across the region. Um, for example, we, um, you know, we've 
we've been really instrumental in helping our members get access to grants during um, the pandemic. And I can't, I don't know the exact number, but we've um, helped our members get in, in excess of £100,000 worth of grant funding um, over the last 12 months. We also invite experts um, to run sessions to educate and inform our members um, in our lightning talk programmes. If you've got, um, if you want to talk to our members, just contact me. Um, I'm always looking for phenomenal speakers for our Thursday sessions at 12. We have an online academy programme. Um, as has been alluded to, we, we, we support our members with PR. Um, we've, our members have had literally had tens, tens of thousands of pounds worth of press coverage as a result of the PR support that they've had from Hermione. And of course, you know, the thing that you can't put money on is they've had access to one-to-one -one coaching with our founders. We all heard Hayden talk earlier um, and he shared his, um, you know, their journey of in entrepreneurship. So we're all, you know, able to learn from the experience um, of the people that have gone before us. And for that, we're incredibly um, grateful. You know, what we actually do, the thing that we never really talk about, you won't find it on a website, um, is that we help our members to be even more ambitious. We help them to, to take calculated risks, to make mistakes, but learn fast. Um, we push them to scale um, and also to believe in themselves. You know, it's a lonely business being an entrepreneur, but when you're a member of the community here at the Innovation Labs, you're never alone again. Um, and of course, we connect them to wonderful people like you who can support and help them. Um, if you want to find out more about us, we are based in Stone Market. Um, my details are on screen. By all means, give me a call. Um, thank you very much for the time and the opportunity to talk to you all today. Back to you, Tim. Thank you, Liz. Brilliant. Um, okay. Uh, that was great. Um, I think maybe I need to unspotlight you or something. Anyway. Um, I'm just going to, uh, yes, yeah, so I'm just going to waffle for a minute. Uh, we are running slightly ahead of schedule. So we were due to start our panel at 12, but I think we might be starting a few minutes early. Um, I've actually have got a question for Liz. I don't know if you want to come back, if you're still there, if you want to kind of come back on screen. Hello. It'd be really great. Um, so Innovation Labs, which has only been going for, um, well, just under two years now. Yep. And, and a lot of that time during lockdowns, um, operating virtually. I mean, when I look at the kind of roster of companies that you've supported, that would seem to me to be something that any extremely well-funded um, uh, incubator uh, would be proud of, really proud of. So my question I think is, is, is kind of what's different or what's worked do you think for Innovation Labs? Is it location? Is it your pricing? Is it your price point? Is it your, is it referrals, word of mouth? Because you know, you were a new, you were a new um new on the block. And and yeah, okay. I I mean, both Peter Brady, Peter Basford, Hermione, you know, fantastic people who've done um, a lot, I think, to sort of develop their networks. But this, this is, this is uh, a great success story. So what is different about it compared with some of the other, let's say, more established incubators in the region that would perhaps be quite envious of your uh, success? Well, that's very kind of you to say so. Thank you, Tim. Um, I haven't actually been to any of the other incubators, so I can't talk about them. I can only talk about us. Um, I think... I believe the thing that we've done differently is, and it goes back to what Hayden was saying at the beginning, you know, we can't, you can't do this alone. We've had tremendous support from Mid Suffolk um, District Council, New Anglia, LEP were phenomenal in helping us create a virtual members program. Um, I think um, Scott will probably remember the exact date. I can't remember. I think it was during, at some point during the pandemic. Um, I think it was um, September last year. Um, it's really unsexy to say this, Tim, but the fact of the matter is we really care about our members. Um, we treat them as human beings. We look at them as individuals. We don't have a one fits all approach and they get very bespoke um, support and 
connections and our, our founders are really good at connecting our members into other people's networks and connecting them with other players who can help and support them. Okay. The other thing that's happened is the community has has almost become self um, it's it's a bit of machine based learning really basically everyone's supporting everyone. Um, members are working with other members they're supporting each other they're saying I did this perhaps you could do that too. Um, and we're sharing, the, there's, a, there's almost like a knowledge transfer that's going on within the community that's becoming um, self-supporting. So the community has really evolved and supported itself. And I think, you know, lockdown has created opportunities for us to become more connected. Um, we saw it as an opportunity to try and get connections between our members, whereas when the world was disconnecting um, and actually, I think that's helped us enormously. Yeah. Well, I, would, I mean, I, I would say that I'm the community manager. Um, and there yeah. are lots of <laughs> there are lots of other things that we've done, but I, I don't think it's just you know we're if anyone that were to ever visit us, we're a relatively small space. Um, we're probably one of the smallest spaces, um, but we support um, thanks to the the funding that we did receive from New Anglia Lap, um, we are able to support um, members across North Norfolk and Suffolk. Um, and we've done that really successfully um, online. Now That's, we're just trying to, we're trying to get them back into the space now because they're all a bit too comfortable at home. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, you know, this, this might be a topic that we would like to, I'd like to explore a bit with the, with the, with the panel. So um, uh, the, this question of um, the kind of where, the geography bit of, of, of innovation, because uh, East of England is quite a big place and it's a long way from, you know, it's a long way from Cromer to Sudbury, if you know what I mean. Um, so, uh Perhaps, perhaps we can widen this up. But what I'm going to suggest, because we, we're actually four minutes ahead of time, is if people want to take just like a kind of a very short comfort break, we'll be back at, on the dot of noon for the panel. And I'm hoping that most of the speakers and uh, 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 Scott will be able to, to join for the panel. So um, let's just, let's just give, it, give, give ourselves... Uh, three or four minutes, and then we'll be back on the dot of 12. Thanks. Okay, folks, we are shortly going to be uh, starting again. Uh, it's one minute to 12 by my watch. Uh, so, hello, Scott. Uh, for those, for, for, for any, any um, uh, speakers, panelists, hello, hello. We're going to have a, a big gallery of faces in a minute, I'm, I'm hoping. Laura. Um, so for those uh, for those delegates who haven't had a chance, or no, no one's had a chance to ask any questions yet, um, other than a couple of comments in the chat. So please do start asking questions in chat or Q&A and don't be shy because otherwise I'm going to ask all the questions and that's going to be very boring for everybody. Um, but I mean everyone can come off mute actually. I don't mind if, um, if, if we have a few, if we've got a bit of background noise that's fine. I know that a couple of people have, have had to have had to duck out early, but hopefully we've got in, we will have enough we'll have enough here to make this a useful panel. I've had to put my coat on. Look, <laughs> it's cold <laughs> in the garage. Great. Um, well, um, good. So we've got Scott. We've got Ace from Beta, Laura, Shamal, Liz, Geraint, Kurt. I know Hayden's had to go and I know Michael's had to go. So um, I suggest we make a start. Now, chat, I'm gonna open that just in case anyone's asking questions, but I'm gonna kick this off and I'm gonna build on what we uh, were talking about, what Liz and I were talking about just now, which is about the kind of the, when we talk about innovation, uh, I'd like to talk about kind of place and geography within that because, you know, the, the, there was an argument, wasn't there, during COVID and, and lockdown or during 
we're not through it yet, but during the lockdowns, that you know, a lot of this activity could be transacted online, on Zoom, on Teams, or whatever. Um, didn't really matter so much where you were anymore, so long as you had an internet connection or a phone signal, you could do innovation. Didn't really matter where you were. And I suppose my question for people is: to what what is the what is the balance between having a physical hub location where your business can kind of like be incubated and where you can actually physically meet people and access mentoring. And let's think of more like a virtual membership where that could be an expanded community that's less geographically constrained. And one of the reasons is, I think, as I said, if you look across Norfolk and Suffolk, there are hot spots. And there are cold spots in terms of geographic coverage, right? So there are places where you can travel for miles and miles and miles and not find a hub. And then there are areas where there's two or three within a city location, let's say. And given that we're quite a rural area, we have market towns, coastal towns, deprived communities, that whole kind of leveling up thing. You know, how do we make sure that innovation is accessible to everybody, that it doesn't matter where you're, you know, it's not a postcode lottery. Um, and I'm actually going to, I mean, Babita, you know, Babita, I'm going to ask Babita maybe to come in on this because Babita, you're part of a, a wider organization called Oxford Innovation that runs Epicenter. Um, Oxford Innovation also runs Innovation Center at Knowledge Gateway in Colchester, just down the road. I mean, what's your thinking about this topic, Babita? Well, you Oxford Innovation, it's 27 centres around the UK, and that's um, a mixture of where we're we working with academic institutions as well as private um, landlords as well. The ethos of Oxford Innovation is all around supporting companies, early stage companies, to come into the centres and then to support them through um, with business support and advice and, and get them to a stage over an 18 month to two year period and then to exit the centre. So it really is about flow. It's about bringing those organisations in, helping them to grow, helping them with whatever they need help, and whether that is raising investment, whether that's growing their teams, whether that's commercialising their technology, and then also helping them to exit into, into the system. So I think it's a, you know, that that is the essence of what innovation centres are all about. It's about supporting economic clients in the regions where they set up and a huge amount of, of um, you know I know that Lisa saying she hasn't had a chance to go around and see all the centres yet and um, we've been fortunate enough that you know Kelly and I who's the centre manager here we spent quite a lot of time going out and meeting with the other innovation centres and looking at how we can work together collaboratively as well in the end you know customers will choose a certain centre because of its location and facilities but as, a, as across the region, we're really keen to see how we can become more joined up as well with what we're offering to our customers. I mean, Liz, you kind of advocated uh, the, the, the value for Stowe Market and the sort of geographic radius around Stowe Market of um, having, having innovation labs there. I mean... Correct me if I'm wrong, Innovation Labs have got plans to, 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 to do more and in other places. Can you talk about any of that or is it a bit too early? I'm not, I'm not sure I'm allowed to talk about that right now. Um, but <laughs> I think it's in the public domain that the, 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 there has been some, uh, that there are some plans in place. I think it's probably yeah. so in there are, places, but if you can't talk about it, that's fine. I won't, I won't talk specifics, but um, I, 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 going back to the geography point, I think geography is important. There's there's something really powerful, you know, um, Geraint and I were talking about this earlier, there's something really powerful about a commute um, and actually being able to step out of your house and step into work. Um, and I know that for some, lots of our members that have physically come to Stone Market, it's for them, it's really important to have that thinking time between home and work and that also that separation. And I, I don't think we should ever downplay that in a world where, which is so virtual. So part of our growth plan is to open other innovation labs in other locations um, to your point Tim in some of the small market towns that aren't necessarily served with co-working spaces um, and actually be enable 
people in those small market towns to access our network and our, our, our greater connected network of all of us fab people, um, to Babita's point. Um, so yeah, so I think, you know, there, I think it is really important that there is access to centres um, geographically diverse, um, because not everybody um, can, you know, we need to make sure we're accessible to every 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 citizen within our kind of network and that we're not only for people who can get to certain locations. I think it's really important personally. So building on that, you also talked about, you know, access to the founders, access to the um, you know, the entrepreneurs behind the lab being 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 a really important part of the value proposition. Uh, Geraint Schmel, you know, might, might, might want to come in on, on, on this one, and Asa likewise. I mean, is the future of innovation and these hubs more about private sector entrepreneurs playing a role in their communities? Is this a commune? Is this as like a, is this more like a social enterprise thing, which is about democratizing innovation? in places that don't have it anyway. Does the role of the public okay. sector need to increase, stay about the same, decrease for it to be a healthy ecosystem? I mean, these are, these are questions I'm just interested in people's views on because you know, there's probably been a bit of a narrative over the last 10 years in tech innovation that you know, we need to wait for uh, the big, you know, the central government to write some checks uh, to set open centers or we need to get big corporates to do corporate incubators or accelerators. But it feels like in Norfolk and Suffolk, we're doing it a bit differently now. And I'd just be interested in people's views on that. Geraint. Yeah, so, you know, let me just go back to when I started up. I, I was on my own. I had an idea. I saw something I could do better than anybody else I'd met in my career. And I decided to set my own company up. That decision was done by me and my wife and my loved ones. And I knew I needed a space. And it was a joke earlier, but it was true. I just needed Wi-Fi and coffee. I wanted a small commute. I wanted to get away from my, my wonderful young children so I could actually innovate and work. I wanted that commute and I wanted Wi-Fi and coffee. And the moment I came to a co-working innovation hub and I sat down and another human being that didn't know me, didn't know anything about my company, showed an interest in my company. They, they cared. They gave a shit. That was phenomenal for me. I couldn't believe someone who had no interest in what I do suddenly had an interest in what I did. And that was incredibly powerful and enabling for me to grow. In, in, to, to point to your, one of the things you said there, Tim, though, who owns this? Is it a government? Is it a local authority? Is it a large corporate that operates out of somewhere? Um, I think they all play a part. I would not have come here if it was sponsored by McDonald's. <laughs> um, I, I probably wouldn't have come here if it was sponsored by BT. I'm sorry. If it, if it had that corporate brand on it, I probably wouldn't have done this. It was because it, it was agnostic to that, that that worked really well for me and my organization, if that makes sense. That's a really, I think that's really, really interesting. So, you know, if we're looking at the whole ecosystem where we've got kind of what I would see as a spectrum from grassroots, more community-based, more entrepreneur-led centers uh, to uh, kind of through some sort of um, county council or public sector owned and funded centers through to networks like the Oxford Innovation Network, which is a sort of specialist operator in, in the space up to kind of corporate, um, uh, you know, corporate incubators and, uh, and, and spaces a bit like Innovation Marshall is obviously part of that BT world. The, it's horses for courses, right? Depending on who you are and what you want to do and what your you know, wants and needs are and very specifically where you're physically based as well, back to the short commute point, will influence where you choose to be. So for example, there's a new um, co-work space in Saxmundham uh, in Suffolk, uh, which is called the art space. It's very much, you know, it's kind of the art station is very much around creative businesses. Um, but it's also 
kind of quite funky and it's quite interesting, but it's certainly not owned by a corporate. At the other end of the spectrum, you know, sort of down the road in London, you've got things like, you know, Cisco or, um, you, you know, Telefonica running, running, running incubators, where it's all about getting into the supply, the innovation, um, open innovation uh, networks and supply chains of big businesses. So horses for courses, yeah? But Tim, I think it's I think it's important to to Babita's point. You know, where are the entrepreneurs on their journey? You know, Babita effectively said, you know, we, we want to support them for eight, you know, not support them, but 18, 24 months, we we help them grow and help them move out. Um, and I think that's actually what we do. We almost we're almost like a safe nest for start really early startup entrepreneurs. And that's the thing that we can do really well because we care and we, you know can surround them with support with the you know the likes of the support that we've received you know as a business from New Anglia Lap you know the services that Laura and her team um, you know enable by connecting our, our entrepreneurs we actually enable them to be successful and if they are successful guess what they're going to grow they're going to employ people and they're going to move on you know we they're not going to stay with us and we actually want that we want our entrepreneurs to grow to scale and to move out um so we can get the next next lot in and i think that's where you know the really big centers um the likes of you know some of the ones in cambridge um and you know some of the other brands that you've mentioned are really helpful because it's kind of like the next level what we do is really at the micro level i think in terms of helping entrepreneurs start and scale and what we do is we help them make money because if you're not making money and you can't pay your bills guess what you can't afford to continue in your business i think also if i could just add to that just one small point which is being in that environment, being surrounded by other people who are very similar to you gives you a level of validation, which is almost like a human need. And I think when you're very early on in your journey, you need that because it's, it's very easy to start to question whether you're doing the right thing. So I think to be with other like-minded individuals helps significantly. That's really interesting. So oh, Kurt's coming in. Yeah, Kurt. Yeah, I, I was just wondering, because obviously this conversation's new to me, but um, there's a couple of things that sprung to mind early on, but um, around, you know, depending what you mean by innovation, you know, if, if it's about people building new companies and all of that, yeah, there's support there. But what if you're a person in the rural county and, you, you know, you haven't got a job and you're trying to innovate and the one of these hubs isn't near you there's a practical thing there and the other thing for me is you know a, a lot of innovation is based around digital isn't it so you need the connectivity and some places in our rural county have got poor mobile phone coverage uh, you know let alone uh, not very good broadband so we heard about a game company earlier didn't we um and if you say you were in the, the dark depths of Norfolk or Suffolk and, and you wanted to start a game company and you wanted to do, do it from your home, how do you do that if you're, you, you haven't got good performance? So there are other, other things that need to be considered, I think. There are. I mean, I think the answer probably to that is don't start it from home. Start it from one of the hubs if you can get there. And if you can't, I think we're going to have to just continue to lobby for uh, <laughs> better digital infrastructure. I mean, it clearly is a big part of innovation. And um, I mentioned the Tech UK uh, Local Digital Capital Index when I, we started off. It's interesting if you look at you know where the region ranks, super high for innovation pretty high for talent, pretty high for access to finance and funding, pretty lousy for uh, digital infrastructure. That's just, mm -hmm. it's, where we, it's where we are. And I, and, and I think that's kind of something with the, the colleagues in the LEP and the county councils and the local authorities and the chambers of commerce, we've got to be pushing, pushing, pushing all the time for, for, for that. Uh, but, you know, a short way down the road, a bike ride, a, a short drive or, or, or on public transport, there may be a hub. And I know Scott's been doing some brilliant work mapping it all out as part of this. I think there's a thing called the Innovation Prospectus, Scott, on the LET website, isn't there? You might want to put a link to that in the in the chat for people who haven't seen it. Um, yeah, but I think. I mean, sorry, Tim. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll share the link shortly. But yeah, I think, I mean, I've, I've seen things in terms of transport and connectivity. You know, there are ongoing challenges. But I think through certainly from the Connected Innovation Project, from ourselves, you know working at the LEP 
and working with the innovation hubs, you know, it's one of the sort of key areas that we're looking to sort of, you know, drive this much more connected network. Um, that means that you have access to this wider network of the hubs, you know, you have that wider capability, their wider support that you can access. And I think, you know, one of the key things I always notice with the hubs in terms of, you know, especially with the beta and with Liz as well, is that, you know, it's the it's their mindset about how they view, how they run their, you know, their, their hubs that makes them so successful as well it's you know that the, the ongoing support there and like Garant said you know he walks in there and there's someone straight there who's, who's there to talk to them who's there to support them rather than you know your kind of typical landlord who's you know wants to make sure that the rent is collected at the end of every month so and I think you know what we're trying to sort of move forward really is you know being able to understand the challenges like you mentioned Kurt in terms of the kind of transport and connectivity and infrastructure in terms of how we can move that forward from a probably a wider and more external perspective but certainly in terms of the project it's about you know being able to drive forward the connectivity between the hubs to make sure that you know where there are people that are looking to start the businesses they're you know they're looking for the support they can actually they're able to access it on a much wider scale rather than maybe being bound by their own locality yeah, I was just I was just thinking that um, I, I've spoken to quite a few people about the gaming industry, and and you know we, we get uni students leave who want to start a start a gaming company or start a, a technology business, but um, when you when you talk to them, um, I may get a different view to to the people who deal with them all the time on here, but they you know they they want to do it from home, and some of the people they work with. Are all over the country, so net, going to a hub doesn't necessarily work in in that scenario, does it? So, so I I, I know someone who's trying to start a, a gaming company up, and they've got people all around the world, so not just in the UK. So connectivity becomes more and more important to these technology companies. Um, yeah, it's just interesting conversation, isn't it? Just to understand, but the the stuff you're going to share about about that that link that perspectives would be quite interesting, I think. Um, I mean, course, I mean right. it's sort of like that, that we, we as a game studio have people all over the country. Um, but actually, when you're actually building a game, uh, the, the collaboration in terms of the creation part, it's really, really important. So we, we manage that by running workshops here. Um, and uh, we bring the people in to the workshop. The workshops run for about three days. The ones that travel in stay in hotel. Um, and... and you know, you can't be that having the facilities where you come to the, the office bound that, that, that puts you into work mindset and a, a place where you can collaborate. And it, with all, you know, a lot of games development companies, a lot of indie development companies don't succeed because they're spread out the way they are. You know, it's hard for them to deliver on, on, on a project because they're not really engaging with each other constantly. <clears throat> Although they say they are through teams, but the reality is it's not actually as easy as people think. It's just very, very hard. And when you're when you're doing a Zoom call or a team call, you know, it's it's not as um, it's just not as welcoming, as warm. It's very structured and sterile, in the, which is very different to when you're in the room with people, you know. And uh, and there's absolutely no way we could have run our workshops in the right place, you know, bringing people together. And for us, during the pandemic, it's been very hard because we've not been able to bring people together. We've had to do it where we've had gaps and we've been allowed to. Um, you know, and you know, we we did a, a, a workshop before the the last lockdown towards the end of last year, and uh, and we've 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 only started doing them again. So you know, it is a. I think we, we, we miss not being able to bring people together, but certainly it's important. That's great. Shamal, I'd be really interested to hear from you on this, on, on, on your experiences. I know, I know you're part of Innovation Labs, but I mean, your early yeah. stage, you've got ambition, you've got a mission. Um, you clearly feel you're, like you're in the right place, but I mean, what's your, what was your sort of thought process when you were looking at where to, to land? Yeah, so um, when, when we first started in 2019, I joined uh, Set Squared, which is a three hour ride one way, <laughs> drive one way. So uh, although, you know, they're, they're quite a big accelerator, um, you know, I had to think, you know, six hours on the road when, when I had to meet a, a mentor or advisor or take part in a pitch session, etc. So um, kind of location has been my 
you know, since then, location has been the, the key driver, basically. Then I, I uh, joined uh, Cambridge, in, uh, Cambridge Social Ventures, uh, run by J the Judge Business School. Uh, they were a one hour's drive, basically, because I, I run another business. I, I, I'm a co-founder of another business. So, you know, I'm, I'm doing this and I'm kind of spreading my time half and half between the two businesses. And from that, so I have to save time from where I can. So that has been the key. I mean, they're all great. They, they help you in different ways. But from what I found, uh, with the Innovation Labs is, is the community and, and the mentors, they're really approachable. Uh, so I know if I have a, a question or, or, or I, need, I need to talk to someone uh, because you can be, uh, you, know, you can get all alone in this, <laughs> in this uh, job. So um, I, I know that I can WhatsApp Peter, Peter, the two Peters, as you know, uh, either of the Peters or, or Liz or, or Hermione uh, and say, you know, can I, can I get half an hour of your time? Uh, and then, you know, they're there for you. Um, so uh, uh, that's, that's been the, the main thing. Uh, I, I may not have shared this with Liz before. Uh, I was actually thinking of moving to Cambridge because, you know, before I found out about uh, Innovation Labs, uh, because I, I thought, uh, you know, I can take both my businesses uh, to Cambridge. Uh, and I was I moved down to store market from Cambridge uh, because of a merger that I had with the other business, um, and you know felt you know there are people that I work with colleagues they're great but you can't talk about the problems they have with you know within your business you know from a from an entrepreneur point of view with with your colleagues uh, because you know we, we talk about day to day stuff projects and everything but uh, yeah so I mean. Our office is just upstairs to Innovation Labs. I didn't find out about Innovation Labs for six months since they started last February, I think. Um, so I was planning uh, the move. And I met, uh, I think, Peter Brady in the car park because uh, uh, you know, we were both heading out. And uh, I said, hello, because I, I've known about Orbital Media and you know, I was kind of following them, that company, his company. And uh, he said, he asked me what we we're doing, et cetera, and then asked, have you, do you know about Innovation Labs? Just pointing uh, uh, the, to the sign and said, no, uh, you know, uh, and uh, that's how I joined. Uh, and so I kind of didn't move to Cambridge because you know, they, I don't need to move because uh, uh, we have everything that we want in, in, in store market now. I'm, I'm not just saying just because of Innovation Labs, but the region is coming up really nicely. Um, Lauren, uh, the, this, the grant support team has, has helped me. Um, and the, the, uh, I've met great people. Uh, I've, uh, I've met uh, Brian Bush. I don't know if you've heard of uh, him, um, uh, you know, through this, this network. Um, so yeah, so um, I'm kind of uh, happy that I made the decision here uh, you know, to stay here. Um, for me, the location, uh, it, it was the key basically. Um, so if, if that helps. That really helps. Yeah. I mean, you're happy. We're happy too. I mean, you are like an economic development officer's uh, dream uh, because uh, you've, you've, you've said, I think what, you know, what government, particularly local government, regional governments are always trying to do, which is, you know, kind of avoid that kind of brain drain. Um, I don't think any of us are particularly um, would see someone moving to Cambridge as a brain drain because, you know, Cambridge is part of this, this region, but uh, the message is, I think clearly you don't have to go to the Valley. You don't have to go to London. You don't have to go to Tel Aviv. You know, you don't have to go to Paris to, 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 to have a successful tech startup. And, 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 and the sort of vectors or the factors I think that I was writing down, you know, are here are, you know, where, where are you based? You know, where's home? What stage is your company at? Um, what vertical market are you in? What was and, and you know where where does that where is your sort of total addressable market most likely to be a fruitful place for you to start? Uh, how ambitious are you? And if you're not ambitious to start with, you know by the time you've met your peer group and a few mentors, you, you chances are you'll be more ambitious because it's that community that that social we're social animals, aren't aren't we? And 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 I think to to to, to um, Geraint's point earlier, it's also kind of what's your taste? Is your taste for the corporate? Is it for the academic? Is it for the 
grassroots? Is it for the funky? Is it for the indie? You know, what's all of those are things that I think we should all be thinking about when we're trying to stimulate more innovation. Um, we're 26 minutes past. I'm just going to um, just as a four minute warning. And I think my last question, and I'd just be interested in people's immediate thoughts. Um, uh, I mean, Scott, you're exempt from this to some extent because you, you are Mr. Connected Innovation and you probably, uh, you'd probably have a view, but I mean, if you want to talk about it, but to everybody else, it's like for each of you, whether you're an entrepreneur or whether you're a program, you know, program manager or, you know, managing a center. I mean, like, what's the, big thing what would be the big thing that you would like to kind of get ticked off on the on the on the wish list kurt's talked about infrastructure digital infrastructure being a big wish i'm not going to i'm not going to allow any more conversation about that because that kind of feels like it's a bit out of our hands but in terms of actionable stuff locally what would be like the big thing is it talent is it access to finance is it grow on space is it more connections? Is it more customers? Is it international? What is it? So um, I'm going to take, um, I'll take Asa first. Okay, that's an easy one. Access to finance and, and talent. Access to finance, access to talent. Shamal. Um, for me, all of the above, really. Uh, so access to finance is, is obviously, you know, you can't run without that but connections, um, connections to the councils um, and, and talent. Um, uh, with my other business, uh, we, we seek talent from all over the world. So uh, that hasn't been a, a problem, but uh, yeah. So uh, finance, connections, networking is, is very important. Access to finance, access to talent, access to customers in the public sector in your case. Yeah. And then for the, on the more the provider side, uh, not just, and I won't take, I'd like more businesses to be applying for my program as, a, as an answer, because that's too, that's, that's kind of maybe too, 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 too obvious. But I mean, Liz, from your point of view, is there something that you'd like to see change or improve? Well, I'd like more space. I'm very envious of the amount of space that Babita's got, because we're tiny. Um, <laughs> and actually, you know, you mentioned Grow On Space. We've actually, because of what's happened economically, there is actually Grow On Space in the building that we're in. So we've been very lucky. We're helping our landlord fill his spaces that are empty. And we've negotiated really great rates for our members. Um, but I'd like somewhere bigger because um, I think we need more space to do what we're actually doing and we can do it bigger and better. So I think getting more locations is a great start but also having more space too because people this is the interesting thing people sometimes walk in here and go oh is this it and then you're like yeah but you haven't seen anything yet darling you know this is just this is just you know this is we're, we've got a really poor shop front compared to some spaces i'd love a much bigger better shop front hey don't beat yourself up i think your shop front's quite nice and i love the car park story shamal's shamal's car park eating pizza in the car park is is, 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 is great but yeah I, I see what you mean uh, right we've got one time for very quickly Laura Kurt or the beta your wish list anything to add Kurt. yeah I, I was just going to say um, just pre-lockdown I went to the local hack space and that's where a lot of the, the innovation has come from where of what we're doing and what we found was that they were struggling to find space space that they could go and meet the all the private individuals come together and talk about innovation so i, I support what liz is saying yeah space okay so hack spaces more grow on space laura any 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 thoughts or even yeah from from my point of view um communication and networking um and from our project point of view it's you know, approach us um, even when you see the idea of perhaps going into in innovation funding is way off it's not something you want to look at within the next um, few months it's something which you'd, you'd like to find out more about um, and it's starting those conversations really early because um, we can support in in that sort of side of things um, and then as you get you know, we can um, nurture you through getting your innovation proposal in, in, uh, to a point where you would be confident applying for um, competitions which arise. Um, 
Um, so yeah, um, networking and communication early on would be the thing I'd like to improve upon um, across the region. That's great. And Babita, anything? Yes, so I have two things on my list. Um, I'd like to see improved transport infrastructure. And that's more of a macro thing, but definitely we need that. And um, also, I think if we could get access, financial support for startups to be able to come into innovation centres. Okay. And help them move into the space financially. Love it. So on the, uh, on the startup side, I've got talent, I've got finance, access to customers as big, big drivers. And on the sort of supply side, on the, on the hubs, I've got grow on space, kind of earlier engagement, better networks. And I've also got their digital infrastructure, transport. And, and, and I think, well, you know, the elephant in the room is, could we, could we have subsidize, a heavy subsidy, like a massive intervention rate from government for the... Uh, as it were, the property side. So, so for having a desk, why, why can't having a desk be free up to a point uh, to get people off in the early stage? Just, we could talk about this all day, um, and I hope I haven't dominated the Q&A, but as chair, it's my uh, prerogative to do so, and there weren't any other questions in the chat or Q&A, so I'm assuming everyone's happy. Um, I would just like to now, I think, kind of wrap, wrap up and thank all of our speakers today, um, and, and thanks also to Scott and to Bridget uh, for organizing this uh, with me behind the scenes and, 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 and up front. Scott, thank you for, for co-hosting with me. Thank you for Bridget for making the whole thing run so smoothly. And, and thank you to all of the entrepreneurs and all of the program managers who've spoken today because you know innovation is, a, is about people and it's about people connected to other people, supporting each other to achieve their goals. To AS's point earlier, it's about kind of knowing your focus, but also knowing your limitations and where you can bring other people in. And I hope this has been an interesting event for everybody. I've certainly enjoyed it. Um, I think uh, we've got a bit of a shopping list, uh, Scott and I and others from the left and uh, from the uh, public sector who've been on the call as well as, as delegates have some really good things to think about. And some, and some nuances around the usual stuff. So I'd just like to, again, thank everyone and thank you to all of our attendees and delegates. I know some people are having to go now and dripping off, but it's been uh, another very interesting Connected Innovation morning. And we'll be back soon, probably uh, in the early part of the new year. There will be more. There are loads of events happening across the whole region all the time. Check out um, the various uh, hub websites like Hethel, like Innovation Labs, like Innovation Martlesham, like Epicenter. Uh, there are the others, others, others are available. Check out the Techies website, the stuff on the left website. Engage with us on social media. Um, follow us on LinkedIn, at Twitter, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And on that note, I'm going to wish you all a very good, uh, have a nice lunch and, and a good afternoon, and we'll see you soon. All the best.